I think of money as like a stick of dynamite, right? It is it is leverage to go and blow up the obstacles in the path of you know getting to that that next goal. Hello, hello, and welcome to an epic interview. This is a conversation I looked forward to having and sharing with you for two years now, and today is the day. In the process of building the Almanac of Bology over the past couple years, I have listened to and read almost everything Bology has ever produced. And with all humility, I really think this is one of the single most unique, most personal, most in-depth interviews Bology has ever done. We spent a ton of time together and I had a lot of context going in. It's a different vibe and we cover some very interesting ground. And these are things I don't think you will have heard from Balaji before. A couple quick notes before we jump in. Uh, you'll hear both of us say <laughs> the book. We're like referring to our own books. Balaji wrote a book called The Network State, which is out now, and he's kind of releasing updates to it as he goes. It's an exceptional book. I have, of course, read it. It's very interesting. It's full of ideas. You can check that out. When I say the book or my book, I'm talking about the Almanac of Balaji, um, which is coming out in the first quarter of 2023. I will say this is part of a very long audio session. We spent probably eight hours together and it was edited down to this podcast. I think this is the longest podcast he's ever done as a result of that. But this is really a peek behind the curtain of creating this book for you. An update on the book. It's in the final stages now putting sort of the finishing touches on the manuscript. Jack Butcher is working on the illustrations. Scribe Media is getting started on the publication process. If all goes well, I'm hoping we'll be able to publish this in Q1 uh, and that this interview will make you even more excited for this book to come out. It's a little bit of a teaser, but this episode has a unique sponsor and a unique ad format. The sponsor is Athena, and the ad is a short conversation with the executive assistant I work with through Athena, whose name is Ivan. Athena provides high-quality, full-time remote assistance, exclusively people living in the Philippines. I think it's a fun ad, but I want you to know this is the Bology interview. You are in the right place. And first, you will hear a short chat with Ivan and then a very long chat with Bology. Now, with both ears and everything in between, please enjoy these conversations. Continuing our conversation today with the executive assistant that I've hired through Athena, Ivan. Ivan, welcome back. Part two of our conversation slash very biased endorsement of Athena. Thanks, Eric. Glad to be back. It's a, it's a really important job, honestly. And I, I think the other EAs that I have met, and I am curious for your input on this too. I mean, I was blown away by the caliber of talent and people in the backgrounds of everybody that I met when I visited the Philippines and met all the other EAs, like these are incredibly talented folks. They're well into their career. Uh, Athena gets thousands and thousands of applications like every week to be an EA. Like this is a very, very sought after job that takes a lot of skill and experience to not just do it well, but to do it well at Athena specifically. And that's something I think, you know, you, you and everybody else at Athena should be proud of. Yeah. Athena has a rigorous, um, hiring requirement and they only pick the best of the best. I'm not trying to brag, but uh, <laughs> yeah, Athena doesn't um, just hire someone. The entry point is quite difficult and I've had a lot of people that I know personally that tried and did not get accepted. Of course, I feel bad for them, but um, that just speaks volumes about uh, how Athena chooses its uh, executive assistants. Yeah, you know, I've, I've got a fair few friends and um, I know other listeners of this podcast actually are also Athena clients and the, the clients on the client side, the people that I know are also world beaters. Some of them are extremely successful and hard charging and talented and brilliant. And it is amazing to sort of see see the group of people that comes together around this community. And it's the, and it's the people who really understand that time is the fundamental sort of denominator and constraint in life. And that you need to do all you can to sort of get the most leverage out of your time and where you can hire and work with someone to help, you know, delegate and outsource some of the stuff, the mundane stuff in life or the non-mundane stuff, the, you know, the big, important, ambitious projects that just you feel like you could never really do without a little extra help. And I'm really inspired by, you know, 
Jonathan, the founder, and Robert, the CEO, and how far they've taken this. You know, that we learned a lot in that that episode we did with the CEO and COO, CCO, sorry, of Athena on how far they've taken these delegation playbooks and everything that they've been able to do in their lives because of it is um, is magic. You know, that those their corporations of you are amazing and continue to be. I hope to uh, work towards that over time. And I hope some people listening feel inspired to take that journey. If they want to, you can learn more. Go to athenago.com and check it out. Get on the wait list. I, I can't encourage it highly enough. And, and I hope you appreciate that and knowing that I'm relatively selective with the, you know, what companies I choose to recommend and you know know that I've got a year of experience and uh, as a happy customer myself, having lived it and uh, being excited to share it with more people. Malogy, I'm uh, very, very excited to be talking to you after a year and a half of consuming basically every interview and post and piece that you have written um, that I can possibly find. My goal with this conversation is to be is going to be to get to as many new ideas out of you as I can and fill in the gaps between some of the stuff that you talk about all the time and hopefully round out and give context to um, some of your biggest ideas that I, I think are the most universally helpful and important. I want to start with something that I actually struggle with when I'm kind of like explaining you to people um, and hear like how you would introduce yourself to a, a stranger or a peer that you had just met. Sure. So uh, let me give kind of two versions. The first is what I call sort of the world legible version, like the bio for a, I don't know, for a podcast or, or something like that, which would be, I guess now the Wall Street Journal bestselling author of the network state and former CTO of Coinbase and general partner at Anderson Horowitz uh, and, you know, whatever, like all the professional kind of stuff. Um, and that's useful just because it's legible in the same way that a title in a company is legible at a certain scale. It's kind of helpful to kind of get a sense, okay, who is this person? And then, you know, the, the sort of, I think the other way I kind of think of myself is as a uh, pragmatic ideologue in the sense of I have you know, deep beliefs in what to accomplish and what to build in the future, but I'm absolutely willing to make trade-offs and even take detours, you know, for a long time, you know, in order to to get to that long-term destination and, you know, of life extension and, you know, human 2.0 and and so on, all the transhumanism stuff. That's kind of, I'd say it, or, or engineer, you know, just basically uh, fundamentally very quantitative in how I think about things, even if I'm like verbal on the top layer when underneath it, there's circuitry, you know, <laughs> it's like, a right. You, you take off the plate and there's like calculations underneath every, um, every, every word has, has some hopefully logic to it, at least in my head. I, I hear that. And I hear that in a lot of your, um, your speech and the terminology that you use, um, you know, there's a lot of like mathematical references, which is very interesting. Uh, do you, do you think of, uh, you know, you've been an engineer, you've been an entrepreneur, you've been an investor, you have, I'm not sure how you would classify what you're doing now. Do you, do you think of your work just as sort of whatever it takes to advance this sort of pragmatic ideology that you have, that you've created and believed in? Yeah. I mean, like right now, I guess I'd be writer slash investor. And I think that's going to become a more and more common thing, the angel influencer, the, you know, venture journalist, that, that concept of media plus funding together, I'm not sure we have a term for it because you'll usually classify as either a writer or content creator or an investor, but those are very much blurring together. But let's say angel influencer is kind of what, you know, it's, it's a little bit, most people don't call themselves influencers, whatever, but let's say, Writer slash investor, I think, is probably a better better way of thinking about it. I don't think we have a good term for that person who's creating content and also funding things. My my attempt to coin it was a creator capitalist um, because I'm yeah, partial that's to good. That's pretty good. But uh, Mike Mike Solana likes the sovereign influencer, but basically, you kind of want a term which is. I mean, that's like sort of like doubly highfalutin. You know, like influencer is sort <laughs> of like, oh, I'm an yeah. influencer. You know, like it's it, so it's you know. I don't know if there's a term that. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So, uh, but, but career capitalist is okay. Feels, feels a little twee, but I don't know, some, something like that will, will work. So 
in the service of this sort of ideology, which, which I'd like to sort of get towards and, and get an attempt at articulating, but what what is the thing that, uh, given your current lifespan, you uh, would like to most see achieved um, in, in your work? Getting us onto the transhumanism curve, uh, or, you know, the thing is transhumanism has gotten some flack nowadays from folks who think, as I, as I mentioned, that it just means a change of humanity, but doesn't mean whether it's a change is good or bad. Let's call it optimalism, actually, you know, improving things in the sense of optimizing an objective function and neither using too much technology nor too little, you know, in the same way that obviously you can have too much fire and you can have too little fire. And now we use just enough fire, ideally, to heat the food, but not so much that we burn it down and not so little that we go cold. And that's a very trivial example, but humans have been living with technology forever. And, uh, you know, fire arguably made us human. Richard Rangham has this book on, on this where he uh, um, talks about how the invention of fire allowed us to, you know, humans as a species to outsource our metabolism to the fire and, and allocate more of those scarce calories for the brain and relaxed an evolutionary constraint and made us smarter and made us more human. So we've been sort of co-evolving with technology for a very, very long time, arguably evolutionary timescales, if you believe Rangham's book. And, you know, so against those people who'd say, oh, you know, it's so artificial, all this modern stuff, we have to go back to Gaia. You know, I'd say, well, technology is actually what makes us human. It's what distinguishes man from animal. So leaning into that and really kind of getting us onto that curve that Moore's law for humanity of getting us, you know, both ethically and technologically there to say, yeah, you know, math is good. Getting to Mars is, is good. You know, expanding is good. You know, generating nuclear power is good. Getting away from what uh, J. Storrs Hall calls, quote, ergophobia, namely the concept that it is not just that energy efficiency is good, which we can perhaps all agree on, but that energy production is bad. That in fact, it is in some sense not possible to produce energy. Getting us past those kinds of things, at least some subset of humanity, and getting us on that long term track towards ascent, as opposed to the alternative, which is hitting the ground. You know, like I, I do think that that, you know, long term axis of transhumanism versus anarcho primitivism of going to infinity or arguing conversely that humanity is so sinful and undeserving that you need to degrowth and become animal again. I, I do think that infinity is the much better of those two choices. Um, you know, and so like movies like Interstellar are awesome. Movies like Limitless. I love Limitless. That's a great movie. Um, and I want to make a lot more movies like that. I want to get humans on that track. And that's the kind of thing that I think about. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's a, has been probably, there's probably been somebody on that side of the battle since it began. And there probably will be people on that, you know, carrying that torch forward for, for a long, long time, hopefully. What what are the things that you you believe that you are the best at? Well, you know, it's funny because um, there's stuff that's quantifiable and there's th stuff that's not quantifiable. And the thing is, you know, you have to have a gimlet-eyed view of your own strengths and weaknesses. In fact, the greatest strength is to know one's own weakness. But let me, I'll just point to some things that are sort of uh, like not in a chest thumping way or anything like that, but that I was sort of surprised I was actually pretty good at. For example, you know, I was on Tim Ferriss's podcast last year in 2021, and evidently on a very popular podcast, the first time, I, I really actually hadn't done many podcasts, by the way, before 2021, to, to, in my <laughs> recollection. And I just started doing them. And like Tim Ferriss podcast, was number one and number two of a very popular show in 2021, where it's just me for three hours and me for four hours. Just literally yawn, got out of bed and just like did that <laughs> podcast. And I wasn't like preparing or anything. You didn't and have I, like a couple pots of coffee first or anything? It seemed no, like- No, no, I mean, have. not, not, not I, mean, I can't say I didn't, I, maybe I drank coffee <laughs> that day or something, I, I can't remember. But but I was just, just talking like I would, you know, honestly to a friend and to my surprise, people were like, wow, that's so great. Or I was like, okay. That's interesting. I mean, I kind of knew as a decent public speaker or whatever, but I was surprised that I was like number one and number two on Tim Ferriss's very competitive show. You know, like you kind of, you kind of don't, it's like if someone knows they're like pretty good at like 
uh, at, at running foot races, but they don't know where they'll actually place unless they're in a 400 meter, you know, competition or something like that. So that was surprising to me how many people liked listening to me kind of talk about stuff. Okay. So that was, that was kind of one thing. I think also this concept, uh, Scott Adams talks about this, where somebody can be not necessarily a plus in every area, but they're an A in one area and they're like a B plus in another area, A minus or whatever. And that vector of taking those things together, the combination you're actually pretty good at, or even better than most in, in that particular vector, you know, where you, you combine them. Bezos and Bill Gates have both at different times talked about how when they were in school, there were folks um, at university who, uh, they, they were pretty good at math, both Gates and, and Bezos, but there were folks who were just better than they were at math, at raw math, at raw physics, you know? These are competitive guys and they didn't like to lose. And they knew that they were pretty darn good at math and physics, but they were not going to rewrite the textbook, you know? And that's kind of where I would, you know, like math is very hierarchical. It's it's like a it's like the 400 meters or, you know, something like that. You you know exactly how good you are, like how exactly how you rank. And I was never at the level of like a math Olympiad person, but I was pretty good. I, you know, I could have been like, you know, uh, I was like placing in these various competitions and stuff, but you know, there's, it's like a log scale, you know? So I, I could have been, I was on track to be like a stats professor, like an engineering professor at, you know, university and it probably could have done fairly well at that. But, um, so that's something that I think I'm good at but not necessarily the best at what I've been surprised at is I think like that vector combination of being pretty good at math and, you know, computer science and so on with folks who are out there who are definitely better than I am, but also pretty good as a public speaker. And then, you know, again, there's probably folks who are better than I am, but I think I'm decent at that, but the combination I actually think is relatively infrequent. And so maybe that vector sum is sort of where I've ended up. And, uh, the other thing I actually have been surprised at is actually I'm a I think I'm a decent investor from you know in 2013 starting doing investing then it was not something that I ever thought of as like a special event for because the first you know 30 something years of life you know 28 years of life I was a career academic you know I was just basically doing math stats programming whatever but you know really math all the time and uh, and only got into investing much much later in life than uh, it was not something like today where people are on twitter since they're teens and they're thinking about tech and they're like looking at i mean there's a whole culture around tech entrepreneurship and around venture capital that you can tune into as a teenager that was just totally not present you know when i was growing up i mean the, the dot com bubble that type of stuff was on tv at times people mention it but you could ignore it you know it was definitely not something that was in your social circle. It would be, I don't know the equivalent would be, it'd be, it'd be something that adults did. It was something that 35 year olds did, 40 year olds did. You did not do it when you were a teenager. It was just a distant thing. And it would sort of be like a teenager deciding to become a congressional aide. I don't know the exact analogy, but it's something that would be yeah, relatively it, it, it far. It wasn't remotely cool at that point. It wasn't yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't talked about. It was, it was like a, you know, I don't know, like like deciding to get into automated agriculture or something like that. There wasn't a cultural thing around it. It was you were aware that it was happening, perhaps if you were paying attention, but it definitely wasn't a career path. Anyway, so I was surprised that I was a very good investor. Or very, like again, there's probably people you know. I've never tried to get on the Midas or blah 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 list or anything like that, but I think I've done fa fairly well. Anyway, so those are things I think I'm pretty good at: a speaking, b math, c investing. And, uh, you know, again, there's people who are better in all of these areas than I am, but I think, I, I think I'm okay at those. Yeah. It, it's interesting. I mean, we could probably separate those into, um, some, some innate talent and some earned, certainly earned skill in those different areas. And I think you may be, um, not giving yourself enough credit for, I don't know what the right term is, like a synthesis of ideas across disciplines or something like, you know, he hearing you kind of, um, bring in mental models from physics and a concept from history and synthesize it with current geopolitics is all like, and then project it forwards is, is something like, you know, I, a lot of my heroes are cross disciplinary. Um, and that is something like, I, I think that you are quite gifted at 
And but I appreciate that. Uh, it's funny because the you know part of it is it's you know the legibility point. There's no like you can see one's deficits and one's ranking in a pure math competition. Do you know what I'm saying? But the acts that you're talking about is something that I find very natural. I don't really have to even try to do it, but it does seem to be of value to people, which is sort of that synthesis of different concepts. Yeah. I've had a few people read the current version of the the manuscript and say, like, this has permanently changed the way I think. Like, th this has introduced me to new ideas that have unlocked new capabilities and new perspectives in me, which is, I think, is a huge, a huge benefit. Exactly what we're sort of trying to accomplish by... Awesome. Uh, yeah, helping helping kind of spread those things. This is this is like a, I love this question because um, I think it's a, is it revealing in a few, in a few layers? Um, wh what are the ideas you are most confident telling others that you know for certain? I mean, the trivial is one plus one equals two, or <laughs> the i pi equals negative one. So you know, mathematical theorems are the kinds of things that I'm most confident in telling other people that I know for certain. Um, and I, I know that sounds like it's dodging the question, but it's like <laughs> I, I, in, in like a hundred years, 200 years, 500 yeah. years, 10 days, right. That's, that's going to hold up yeah. to be very strong. Right. And then kind of beyond that, you even, even uh, the reason I said math is even when you get to physics, you start to get into edge cases and, you know, your Newtonian mechanics will have, relativistic correction and and so on right so i don't know i mean like it's basically you know, have you seen that like xkcd where it's like it starts at math and you know the rigor of the disciplines drops off right so everything just gets more probabilistic as i kind of as you kind of go from there are, are there um the word yeah cert certain is a very very high bar and perhaps only math crosses it um if we open that up to um some of the ideologies uh, or, or personal philosophies that you have are which of those, cause you're, you're, you carry some flags in life, you know, and you Pied Piper your way, like some, for some ideas. Um, so what, what are the ideas, I guess, that you are confident enough yourself like what do I believe in? to, what kinds to of go, to yeah, to go hold that flag and say, you know, follow me. You know, so one thing I actually, uh, I'm going to have a, a chapter that I'm adding in the book on this, but this will require a little bit of, uh, maybe I'll just give the quick version, which is I would consider myself in a sense, polytheistic, poly stated, a polytheist, poly status, poly -numist. Okay. Why? Because I am okay with people having different gods that they worship. I'm not like hostile to religion. I'm okay with folks having, and that's like a relatively newer thing, but I think Having seen what the total absence of religion does, I think it's it's actually better for people to have some kind of beliefs. I'm okay with multiple uh, states. I'm not a, an a-statist, and I'm okay with uh, multiple coins. And so, um, what I'm, you know, uh, j just to give a little bit of color on that, in the book I talk about a generalization of God as the most powerful force in the world. The generalization is to a leviathan. And a Leviathan is the most powerful force in the world. It could be God, it could be the state, or it could be a network. Do you believe that the most powerful force is the big guy up high who can hit you with the lightning bolt? Do you believe it is the state with the boys in blue or the military? Or do you believe it is the network, which is newer, but it's encryption or it's a social network that can impose social or monetary penalties on you or can protect, you know, right? So God, state, network are three Leviathans. And they themselves, you can actually do three things on each of them. So just like, just take God, like with a religion, you have atheist, monotheist, polytheist. Someone who believes in no gods, one God, or many gods. And you can extend that concept to the state. And a statist is an anarchist. They don't believe in the state at all. It could be a anarcho-communist or a anarcho-capitalist. A monostatist is like a partisan of the U.S. establishment, the Chinese establishment. These are folks who believe in really one state should win, Right. And uh, then you have a polystatist who's a, like a digital nomad or somebody into competitive government. And they actually believe as a matter of principle that there should be multiple states. And they are often grouped with the anarchist or a statist, but actually quite different because someone like Patrick Friedman, for example, is not saying- yeah, It just depends no who's government. doing the groupings. 
Well, that's right. That's right. So they are both like in the same sense that like a uh, a Christian or you know a monotheist might say that both the atheist and the polytheist are going to hell, right? But they're actually quite different, you know. And so the the monostatist would say the a statist and the polystatist are both going to cause chaos and anarchy, but they actually are very different in terms of how they approach things, right? And then the third thing would be the newest, which is uh, the network. And you, I, I use the term just like you have a, a theist and a statist. I use the term numist, N-U-M-I-S-T, which is like study of coins, right? So the uh, mononumist, or let's start with the anumist. The anumist is the no-coiner who doesn't believe in any network or any currency. They also hate social networks. They want basically, often the anumist is a monostatist and atheist, right? The anumist basically, so there's interaction effects between these, right? They don't believe in God and they don't believe in coins, but they do believe in the government, right? And they don't believe in social networks and they think that's a threat to, quote, democracy. So they're a mono, mono status, right? So there's the anumist, which is a no-coiner. There is a mononumist, which is like a maximalist or crypto tribalist. And then there is a polynumist, which is like a polychainer or polycoiner, right? And so you can actually start to classify. This is a useful way of just adding more dimensionality to things. You can start classifying modern ideologies, not simply by atheist, monotheist, polytheist, but also you could have somebody who is, as I just mentioned, they, they're an atheist, monostatist, anumist, right? Um, that is to say, they don't believe in God, and they do believe in does, And does the world become a better place when there are more, you know, polytheists, polynumists, polystatists? I think so, but... I also recognize that not every shares that belief. That's the thing is that the polytheists are almost like one way tolerant, right? Because you're tolerant of them, but they're not tolerant of you, right? And so that leads to an interesting kind of thing, though, where uh, the, you know, the poly. So my disposition as being polytheist, polystatist, polynumist actually puts into kind of contrast that versus. The uh, just to give a few other morphs, right? I mentioned already the atheist, monostatist, anumist, right? The person who doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in coins, does believe in the government, right? There's another morph, which is the atheist, a statist, mononumist. That's like your maximalist, right? They don't believe in God. Usually, they might believe in God. They might also be. A, they might be a monotheist, right? That's not the primary axis, but they're an atheist or a monotheist. But they're an e-status. They're a crypto anarchist. They really don't believe in any government. All centralization is bad of all kinds. Not just not just against this establishment, but all establishments frequently. But they are for Bitcoin, Bitcoin only, right? Okay. So that kind of person is a different. You're, they're picking, you know, a different combination. And both of those are actually very different than the polystatist, polynumist. That is, you know, a jurisdiction traveler, right? A born nomad in a sense, right? into choice and roaming the world. And so that's that that kind of fits also with the concept of you know going to other planets and expanding and you know re-exploring the frontier and uh you know not just being pinned down in one location but but thinking new things. So not being intellectually or physically pinned down, right? Yeah, it suggests being open on all axis, really. Yeah, that's right. Now, you could counter-argue, and people can sometimes counter-argue. They say, well, if you have that monotheist or monostatist kind of thing, that gives you the alignment that gets you lift off. You know, everybody believes in the same thing, and then they get to, um, you know, a space shuttle launch, like, you know, America puts a man on the moon and so on. And that's a reasonable argument. I actually think that there's, there's, there's some justification for that. But these are sort of, there's a rock, paper, scissors aspect to these kinds of belief systems where um, A can beat B under some conditions and B can beat C and C can beat A. And, you know, there's this sort of give and take there. But I do think that in the medium to long run, it is good to have choice or, you know, if, if we were driving at exit, right, which I talk about a lot, I do think that it is good to have that as an option. The funny thing is when you talk about having exit as an option alongside voice and loyalty, people will often interpret that to say, you say, oh, we need to exit right away, all the time, everywhere. It's the only thing. As opposed to, you're basically bringing it off the x-axis and bringing it up from zero. You know, 
and you just have a, a larger balance. The suggestion that like maybe this building should have doors. That's right. That's right. And so you're like, wow, you want to leave right now? You hate us? Blah, blah, blah. Right. Exactly. So it's this is something which is kind of interesting. And so, you know, often you need to have little slogans that actually have a kind of moderation built into them. For example, cloud first, land last, but not land never. Right. That's like intentionally something that is that is sort of like that. Um, go ahead. Um, I, I'd love to. Um, I feel like we're getting too far into your like the, the stuff that's in the book that people should go read themselves. Um, so I, I want to start a little bit about the the starting conditions of biology. Get a little bit into your your upbringing and what you were um, maybe like as a kid and the environment that you grew up in. People will be against stereotypes, but there are four archetypes. Okay, an archetype is like a like a persona, you know. So just for folks to kind of know where I'm coming from and and whatnot. So uh, parents are from India. I grew up in the U.S. Um, I basically was, you know, of that transitional generation where the first 20 years of my life was essentially spent offline. Um, yeah, let's say 18 years, whatever, because the internet really wasn't kind of working, you know, like, uh, or rather it was there and people talked about it. You heard about it and you kind of used the web browser, but basically, um, so I was born 1980. And so, uh, you know, that meant that, you know, even in your teens, you basically you become like 18 years old and the internet was de definitely something you could ignore. Right. I, I didn't, you didn't need to send email every day. It was actually pretty infrequent. There were no mobile phones. Google wasn't even there yet. Like, so you became like a full-fledged adult, you know, in a legal sense before the internet was there. Okay. And what that meant also is that you could travel and that would actually break connections to the home um, in the sense of like, uh, you know, people used to go to college and then they could reinvent themselves at college because nobody knew them there. They could start afresh, right? That's totally different today where there's like one social graph and people, you know, can kind of, or at least I shouldn't say totally different. It's harder today because there's a continuity of presence and, and if people want to, they can stalk and whatever, right? Unless you use pseudonyms. So being of that transitional generation, I kind of, I think people have called it the uh, Oregon Trail generation. Yeah. In the U.S., ever heard that? Yeah, term I before? played the Oregon Trail growing yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So it's like, I think it's an interesting um, thing to because it meant that you played a computer game that was offline at a certain time. So you knew computers, but you also knew something of the world before computers. And I am sympathetic, very sympathetic, actually, to those kids who. Well, I mean, it's both good and bad, obviously, you know, but uh, the good thing about growing up today is that you have GitHub and Google and Stack. Like, you can learn and accelerate so much faster than you could growing up in the 80s and the early 90s. There's this wealth of amazing information and stuff out there. That's a good part. The bad part, of course, is, you know, there's a lot of really nasty people on the internet and... You know, in the in the eighties and nineties, you know, you'd grow up and people would say things like, "Don't talk to strangers," you know, and then there was this kind of interregnum from I don't know the mid two thousands to the mid twenty tens when everybody was talking to strangers. You know, it seemed okay. Hey, social media is great. We're all online, and uh, you know, you don't just talk to strangers. You get into a stranger's car to go on an Uber ride, and so on. And then various kinds of griefers and trolls and so on figured out that you could get attention for just attacking people for, you know, like behaving in a bad way online. And essentially those offline norms that had sort of been tacitly imported online um, were no longer governing things because people found they could push against them and the platforms were not set up to, to deal with that. Just as an example, Facebook, for example, it started out as um, a bunch of you know, individual siloed college networks. And so people had some context on each other and they had some degree of implicit shared values, even if they didn't think of it quite that way. And then the moment when they networked the networks and also with Twitter being default public, the networking of the networks in like 
2007, and then getting a lot of people online by the early 2000s, like 20, uh, basically by, by 2010, 2011, you started to get the Arab Spring where networking the networks and having people speak at all and know each other was speaking and getting that consensus of starting to destabilize fragile regimes. And then, you know, Naval wrote American Spring about how that was coming to the US and that's played out over the last 10 years as we've seen, right? And so uh, the thing is that my background is, it's almost like, you know, people talk about uh, folks who are born in 1880 before um, like flush toilets and, you know, before like cars were popular and so on. And then by like 1950, they had seen nuclear weapons, like, uh, you know, it, it actually, it, let's say they, they lived until 1970. Yeah. From 1880 to 1970, right. Would 90 years is a long human life. You'd go from outhouses to landing on the moon, right? That was a pretty insane period. And I actually kind of feel like I, I slash we are in the middle of something like that. That is to say, taking everything that Teal is talking about and Jay Storrs Hall is talking about and Tyler Cohen is talking about in terms of stagnation and agreeing with it, but also realizing that there's a Sorosian reflexivity to this kind of stuff where once you can talk about it, once you have it in front of you, you can see that roadblock. Now energy is starting to get cast at it to like move that stagnation out of the way. And I think it will fly out of the way and we will, and we're kind of going to have, I think, a great acceleration. I can sort of feel that building potentially. I mean, in the same time as also like potentially a bizarre hyperinflation, a lot of bad things and good things. Really, you know, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times, right? So I think the background would sort of be that the first 20 years were very, very boring. Um, and they were not, they were totally unexciting. It, you know, the 90s was like the end of politics. Uh, by the way, just to, just to talk about this for a second, because it's a real time capsule for anybody who's like 15 or 20 years younger. I was just remembering this. In the 90s, politics was so boring. Okay. The equivalent, honestly, I'm trying to give the equivalent. The equivalent would be to try to get people excited about like the quarterly meeting of the Ottoman Geico. Empire. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or just think about like ancient history of something that doesn't have any immediate political use. Okay. So, so like, I don't know, like Timberland or something like that. Right. You know, or, or, uh, the Bantu expansion. I don't know. So, some, something which people just can't, can't use as a political weapon today, the Roman empire to some extent. Okay. You can't get kids excited about this. This is not something that people care about that much. You have to have an intellectual interest in it. And it's kind of boring unless you can find some significance of it. That is what politics was in the nineties. It was like this dumb thing for old guys on TV and C-SPAN that was mattered, was, was cool, was video games and MTV and well, okay, I should say MTV uh, video games were cool. They were actually not yet cool then, but MTV was cool. And, uh, you know, the NBA and sports were cool and, you know, Hollywood movies were cool. And it was just like, it was just a, actually a very different time culturally. It was a, it was a giant 10 year in retrospect, it was a giant 10 year vacation. If you were in the U S you could appreciate it. Like it's, it's actually, it was both a good time to be a teenager and it was, um, it was a time that you just like appreciate more in retrospect. Now that might just be, by the way, because everyone's like, oh, our teenagers are so great and everything's kind of downhill after that, which might be the case because you're healthiest or whatever at that time, people are, you know, in their salad years. Whatever. And so it's kind of, down. so that's why, you know, it could, could be. But I also think that if you looked at objective measures of, you know, depression and what have you. I think, you know, teens are like more depressed or whatever nowadays. The 90s is actually a pretty good time. Um, but it was interesting because it was it was like it was boring in a certain way. You could be bored. Was was there a moment where you sort of encountered a technology or some like came onto the internet and came alive and that that became like an inflection point in your your younger life? I'd actually say it was 2001. That is kind of, so there's different inflection points. 2001 is when Google, Google had been around for a couple of years, 98, 99, 
it was 2000 or 2001 that you could really start to use Google to find interesting information online. Right, because people had talked about oh the information superhighway and oh you're gonna have all this information and it was like really bad stuff like Alta Vista Digital and Infoseek and Hotbot those early search engines did not pull up really lots of stuff they're keyword stuff pages you you couldn't really find great content and and it was a two sided market because the content producers wouldn't create the content if they could get outranked by spammers or whatever right so it was actually um, a while it was really 2001. I'd say when Google started to get good enough that you could find interesting things and you could while away some time just querying things and looking things up. This, by the way, was pre-Wikipedia. It was pre-Stack Overflow. It was pre-GitHub. It was pre-Hacker News. It was pre-Twitter. All of that stuff, each one of those things that came online is like a new kind and source of information. And as they came online, I sort of indexed them, you know, and uh, and then you you index them, and then you you get diminishing returns. Like I don't even read Hacker News anymore because it's just hater news, you know, um, and it's just like you know you don't you don't get it or you don't get that much out of it. And so it's almost been something where every few years I sort of feel like my life starts again anew, you know, and it's and now the thing is I also recognize that that growth arc is not that typical. Like actually, you know, I'm in my early forties now, but I feel like I've just started. Okay. Like I really do feel I've just started. And why do I say it? Because like I built up these various resources like distribution and other kinds of things. And now I can actually broadcast some concepts out there and get feedback and, you know, invest some money and, and see things happen. And so it's sort of something where past is being prologue and now I've got a canvas to play with and, and to work with, right? And there's folks who, once they've made a little bit of money, they want to go and just do, you know, just, just be on the beach, Mai Tais or something. And that's fine, right? But I think of money as like a stick of dynamite, right? It is, it is leverage to go and blow up the obstacles in the path of, you know, getting to that, that next goal. And uh, the the thing about that that background that I mentioned is, I don't know, I, I think that aspect of being sort of between past and future, it is almost like, and I know this is a little bit of a weird analogy, but, you know, Ibn Khaldun or the, uh, the concept of the marcher lords, are you familiar with that? So Ibn Khaldun talks about Asabia and how the, the groups that succeed a collapsing empire are those that are like smaller groups that have this sort of, you know, tight knit, you know, kind of thing. Um, it's a moral thing. It's a nationalistic thing. It's something that knits them together as opposed to this, you know, empire that's like disintegrating. It doesn't, people don't believe in each other anymore. Uh, there's another version of that. I think Peter Turchin talks about this, this so-called marcher lords. And he has observed that historically the successors to a, a falling empire are those that are sort of on the boundary between civilization and barbarism right? Or civilization and nature. And why, why on the boundary? Well, they're not, uh, all the way, you know, over as, as, uh, you know, barbarians, right? They're not, um, in the state of nature. So they know something of what civilization is, but they also aren't like the hunger game style people from the capital. They're not the effete, you know, uh, folks at the capital that have forgotten what it is to build things, right? So, so they're kind of neither barbarian nor, you know, I made some word with a B, nor bureaucrat, right? There's something in the middle bourgeoisie, where they're a builder, yeah. right? Not bourgeoisie either, because they're builders. Right? And the reason is the bourgeoisie is more the, the, the bourgeoisie is not doing zero to one. The bourgeoisie is not pulling, you know, redwoods out of the earth, right? They're, this is like the industrialist, right? This is the, People winning the West, you don't think of them as bourgeois. Uh, and nothing against the bourgeois, but the bourgeois are closer to the bureaucrat. No, I, that's what I was suggesting them for. I thought that was the B word you were looking for. Sorry to interrupt. Continue. Oh, the B uh, for the bureaucrat. Oh, I see. Yes, that's right. Yeah. But yeah, I would say the bourgeois are often beaten up by the bureaucrats. They're, anyway, but yeah, so let's say bureaucrat, between bureaucrat and barbarian, there's like a builder, right? And that person is on the frontier in a certain way, because one foot in, 
you know, in barbarism and one foot in civilization. And, you know, with technology and with San Francisco, um, there's no physical frontier, but people did have like one foot in the cloud, which had nothing built and nothing worked, and then one foot in the land. So it was like a quasi frontier, right? Because we ran out of land, but we had cloud left. And, you know, something I think about is, is it possible that that particular generation, which did produce, you know, Zuck and Drew Houston and, you know, a bunch of these folks, um, had something good from the offline. They were also sort of at that boundary generation, right? Uh, old enough to remember what civilization looked like and young enough to really jump on the internet and build stuff on it, right? And, you know, as people have observed, for example, that all the people in politics are, you know, gerontocrats and old, they're all 70 something, 80 something. And they're like, where is that dearth of like younger leadership? And maybe it's because Gen X and the older millennials, all the really talented people went into technology. So that bleeding off of Larry Page and Anderson and Paul Graham and Peter Thiel and, you know, Zuck, that whole group, that cohort that would have been heads of state and like these really, um, you know, amazing national political leaders became national technological leaders, right? So that that split started happening around that time. And I think that there's something to that. And what that left is the folks who can't code, who can't you know, do numbers and so on. Those are the ones who are still in government. And so that's led to this negative feedback loop of demagoguery or what have you. Anyway, so I know it's a digressive remark on background, but maybe that does give some kind of context. Being, you know, like a, an Indian immigrant in the US, uh, I also sort of feel like an advanced scout in a different way where India is now immigrating to the internet, right? So like, and it's in, immigrating in a sense to Western culture. And there's, there's again, this sort of collision of waves. It's interesting kind of thing of like a mix of two cultures. Again, sort of like that frontier type of thing, right? And that's interesting. The reason I say advanced scout is that there's about 5 million Indians who have gone outside of, of India and have done fairly well globally. And now there's a billion something Indians who have just gotten online. And so like, you know, I've mentioned this in podcasts, but people, one thing they've completely not priced in is most English speakers online are going to be Indian in like five years or 10 years. Most followers of most social media things, most upvotes on social media. That is just not something that people have priced in at all. Right. And, and yet like, it's just sort of, it, I, I've been kind of fortunate to have seen V1 of all of these things, but on the cultural dimension not just a technological mention. So there's a useful kind of positioning there, right? Where, you know, somebody like me, if I, if my exact clonal, a clone of myself had been born 100 or 200 or 300 or something years ago, I often think about what I would have been like at that time. And I think the answer is I'd have been probably like a, just a math academic, you know, just a career academic. Um, you wouldn't have had the open world that one has now. And that's, that's like a huge difference. So I do feel fortunate in that sense to be born at this place at this time in this set of circumstances. Let me give a third lens. Okay. So first lens was basically just kind of the time. The second is sort of the cultural parameters and so on. A third lens is uh, disposition. Okay. So if you were a morning person, if you like doing things at the same time every day, if you like your vacations being scheduled, if you like being a person of routine, if you like, you know, all that type of stuff, the 20th century was great for you. It was regimented. It was rectilinear. Everything was in, you know, blocks of time. Everything, you know, was this and that. If you like flexibility, if you like surges of work and then stop and do something else and so on and so forth, if you're a night person, if you're an async person, if you don't like wearing, you know, formal attire all the time, blah, blah. Like essentially the world has been moving in that direction for, uh, for folks like that. And I also feel fortunate because that fits my disposition, right? So I've sort of been born in a certain, a certain kind of person, a certain kind of place, a certain kind of time where there's a certain kind of set of trends. And 
it's kind of like the wind is at your back, right? Because, for example, just stuff that I like becomes popular five or 10 or 15 years later. Example, surfing the internet. Example, using mobile devices like a Palm Pilot. Example, um, I don't know, there's a thousand, uh, cryptocurrency, genomics, machine learning, whatever. Like there's 500 examples like this. And by contrast, if you were somebody who liked routine and you liked the small town and so on, I understand that in many ways life has gotten worse, right? Because those things that you liked are just going away. There is the market is going away for that, I don't know, that local shop that somebody liked. It's just getting blown up and it's a it's a characterless big box or whatever that's coming. I actually, even if I'm pro Amazon in many other ways, I think Amazon is better in certain ways, price and quality or whatever. I understand why people don't like that. And so those for those morning people, uh like they liked wearing a suit to work, right? They liked it when everybody was just talking about what I would consider really boring stuff, sports and the weather, because they like that stability. They don't like the volatility of everything changing. They don't, they don't like the unpredictability and the complexity and so on. They want simplicity. And you know what? Simplicity is really valuable. Stability is really valuable. I understand why they like those things. I haven't caused, I haven't caused this, uh, you know, like complexity, you know, explosion or what have you. It's just something where the internet has kind of caused a lot of this, or there's actually factors even upstream of the internet that I talk about in the book that have caused it, just decentralization broadly. Um, and it's sort of returning to the natural complexity of the world in some ways that the the world was artificially I love lucid in 1950, and it's becoming more complex again as it was before. But, you know, my parents were immigrants from India and um, they were just focused on, working hard in, uh, you know, at a time and in a culture where long distance calls were actually kind of, uh, expensive, very expensive and mail was slow and they were sort of cut off from their home culture. And it's sort of hard to make friends as an adult. And, um, you know, their cultural conventions worked for 1940s, 1950s India. Okay. That's just completely different from like 1980s New York. Okay. And in uh, what would happen is they would, you know, they'd be working and I would be at school and it would basically be like, you know, Lord of the Flies kind of environment where, uh, you know, I, I had learned, you know, a lot of math like early on. And then I went to, uh, you know, school. I mean, I don't know how many details I'll give. Basically, my my uh, my grandfather taught me a lot of math early on, and then he passed away. Uh, and so when I came into like kindergarten, uh, you know, on the wall there was like um, you know some sentence, and the teacher went around the room, and you know nobody could read the sentence. But and I was like, oh, that just says Big Bird goes to kindergarten. And she's like. You know, like this, no, because, you know, at least at that time, the expectation was like a uh, five year olds, you know, aren't able to read or whatever. I was like, oh, yeah, I can read that and I can read all these other books or whatever. And, you know, I knew like basic trig fairly early, like sine and cosine and stuff like that. And so they gave me some test and they were going to skip me ahead several grades. They only skipped me ahead one grade. But what would happen was, uh, you know, I would, say things in school. First of all, school is ridiculously boring because, you know, it, like just you can, I was, I was basically in prison for like the first 10 years of my conscious life. Right. Like from basically age four, like, you know, I, I tweeted this as like, uh, in America, life starts with a, um, 13 year mandatory minimum, the school lag archipelago, right. Because it's K through 12. Right. So, I'm in prison and it's a prison-like environment. Why? You cannot get out. You must go there every day. You cannot avoid these people, okay? Um, you are not choosing your environment. You have no control over your environment. They hate you. Why do they hate me? Uh, well, I was just simply not part of that social network. I, I you know, remember this is pre-internet. I had no cultural role models. I was I, like, how was I dressed up? I was dressed up as like this Indian kid and so all of them are wearing like sports t-shirts or whatever. I just stuck out like a sore thumb. All right. And 
Uh, you know, my parents would like mispronounce words or whatever because, you know, they're immigrants. So I would mispronounce the words. And, uh, you know, so folks would just basically, you know, constantly pick up, you know, they do this thing, for example, where like you'd sit at these desks in a, in like a grid and a kid would go like this from behind and like flick your ear like that. Right. And then you'd like turn around and they'd all like pretend like this, you know, in a very like, you know, kind of thing. And then you turn around and they do it again. It actually kind of really hurt and it stung. Right. And you're not doing anything, but these, you know, these folks will just like bully you. And so, you know, like I would just try to go to my own corner on, you know, the playground and just try to read by myself, um, you know, from the library and all the other kids are kind of playing sports and so on. Again, not the culture that I grew up. Eventually I got into sports or I learned sports, but, uh, you know, I just tried to like read that was, there was like a school library there. And so I would get the like most advanced books that they had and I'd read these storybooks and then what would happen is I'd be reading and then I I had the book like kicked into my face like this by somebody who like, you know, came up while I was like, you know, in a reverie, they kick it into my face because I was just this, you know, kid. I was like the only like non-white kid in this like 400 person, you know, school or whatever. Right. And teachers like, I don't even know what, you know, I don't have a third person camera, so I don't know what they were doing or whatever, but I do know that they certainly were not like, you know, protecting you or whatever they, you know, maybe it's just something where there, there's like 50 kids running around and all you can hear is people crying or whatever. And, uh, and you just, you just don't have camera on and, and, uh, you know, the warden can't watch all the inmates at the same time. Right. And so, you know, eventually though, like, you know, I was like, I guess smart enough that I realized, okay. Uh, when I complained, you know, if I didn't want to, if I said it to my parents, they have, they're basically they didn't even understand. They didn't have a framework for what this was. Okay. And if I went to a teacher, uh, then like, I'd be a loser, uh, because everybody would, you know, hit you as a, as a, you know, like a, you call you a snitch or a narc or something like that today. I forget what the term was. I'd be like a snitch or something like that. So I was like, all right, got to fucking fight. Right. And so I learned basically to just be like a porcupine and I learned that these kids would gang up on me. And so then I started like having, you know, like literally like prison, you know, I'd have the, the book like this and they'd come and I'd be pretending to read. And then the first guy I'd just like smash him in the fucking face. Right. And, you know, then they'd be really sh stunned. Then I'd like throw the book at him and like just start kicking like this and like look around like that and like snarl at them. Right. Spit. And, you know, I had to develop a reputation to be absolutely fucking crazy when these people, so th then you're, then the, uh, the direction of the attack is flipped. Now you've actually imposed the possibility of downside on the attacker, right? Where, um, now suddenly they're like, okay, I was expecting like some fun, you know, kind of thing here. Right. And now suddenly like maybe the hunter has become the hunted. So like repeat that for 10 years. Okay. And so it was, a, it was a pattern of basically being in prison and having to fight. And then like when I fought back, the kid who attacked me would have all of his friends, as I said, you know, we'd all be at the principal's office and they'd all be like, oh, you know, this kid is completely fucking crazy, man. He's crazy, blah, blah. You know, he hit me with this, blah, look at the bruise, blah. And uh, so then I'd go to detention or whatever. And so... Um, and you know, actually detention was good. I preferred solitary. You know why? I could fucking read again. There we go. <laughs> I could read, right. So I preferred that. So, you know, at the front of school, they would have high honor roll and detention. And I was always at the top of both. Right now. Was I, was I like in retrospect, was I probably, uh, did I bring that on myself and so on? You know, Elon also talked about how he was like attacked in school a lot. But Alon's personality is also something where he is a leader of men and domineering and so on. And so you can actually now with some perspective, I'm like, oh, I probably gave off some vibe of I'm, you know, I'm smarter or I'm, you know, like I should be in charge or something like that. There's probably something that I did like that. Even, you know, now I, I understand how to channel that or whatever. I just didn't have any cultural you know, awareness for what could and couldn't be said or done. You know, I'm, you know, just like acting on instinct or whatever. Like, you know, for example, just like a small thing, 
th there's various ways that one is supposed to be self-effacing when you get an award. Oh, I'm humbled, right? You kind of see that. And it's just a cultural convention, which you wouldn't know exactly how you're supposed to accept an award unless you've already seen that, okay? And so it's, it's possibly the case, probably the case, that there was something I did that was like, you know, provocative to them, okay? Um, and maybe if I looked at it and like I had a third person camera, I would wince and be like, oh, of course, that's why they were attacking or, or something like that. But net net though, is that, um, you know, for years of my life, uh, you know, you know, you know what locked in syndrome is locked in syndrome. It's like this horrible condition where somebody's brain works, but they like, can't move their limbs and stuff like that. So they're like locked into their own body or whatever. Right. So, you know, not quite like that, but, you know, I was, you know, it was like locked in, in the sense of, I don't know, I was reading at like a pretty like high level, pretty early on, uh, you know, my parents were working all the time, you know, they had, you know, we had sick relatives and, and, you know, stuff like that. We, so a lot of money went to that, you know, and, um, so they were just focused on their thing. And, you know, like now, you know, once one becomes a parent, for example, you realize like, a kid's problems are like nothing relative to an adult's problem. So, you know, it's just, it's just not something that computes in the same way. Right. And so, uh, so basically that was like my life for many, many years. And I had to escape into this inner world of fiction and so on, and just go through books. Right. And learn, you know, I mean, it's not like I became like some karate master or anything like that, but like, you know, Krav Maga, right? Like the Israeli style of like extremely practical fighting, right? So I learned basically to deter aggression in certain ways. You know, I learned, you know, how to attain like defensible position. I learned that the state was not on your side. You know, I, I you know, all this type of stuff. Now there wasn't any possibility of like building a counter movement of my own at that time. There wasn't any, none of those tools I had, right? But basically, I just got like, you know, attacked for a very long period of time. And, you know, I don't like, you know, there's some people who have that and they like, uh, they hate as a, as a function of that. Right. And I, I don't. Right. Like, I, you know, I, I, or at least I don't think I do. But I do know how to fight when I need to fight. Right. Now, that's like, you know, the only reason I actually haven't thought about this in a long time is just that, you know, this article came up there. But one way of thinking about it is, this is certainly like how the journos interact with most people, right? And, you know, all the bullying tactics that they did in the 2010s, ganging up on tech people, hitting them. Many folks just like lost their jobs, you know, were destroyed economically, destroyed reputationally, like just done, finished, pushed to zero, right? But all of this kind of mentality like recognizing, like kind of seeing that happen again, right? I was like, okay, I kind of know, you know, who these people are, right? Uh, and I know how to deal with them. And uh, that was actually a huge surprise to the journos. Uh, so yeah, so that's my kind of background, I guess, is at the edge of various kinds of things from the offline world to the online world, at the frontier on the West Coast, you know, the, the first wave of Indian immigration, like the, the, the day person to night person shift, which I think is a much bigger deal than people think, by the way, it just changes the entire rhythm of society. Was, was, was there a journey towards becoming the, the biology that we kind of know today, or w would like your parents or friends have been like, this dude was like this when he was 12. That's a good question. Um, I think that I, I had a lot of character traits, I think, that are continuous, but they were not things that had ROI, quite the contrary, <laughs> okay? So- yeah, tell, me, tell me that story. Well, you know, so I, I was never one to simply listen to, uh, you know, my teachers in school. Uh, uh, for example, there was a physics teacher who was saying something like, you know, when you put your clothes in the, you, you dry your clothes in the washing machine, it goes around in a circle. 
yes, what is it, Mr. Srinivas? And how could you possibly have a question now? I'm like, don't you, uh, don't you wash clothes in the washing machine rather than dry clothes in the washing machine? You know, like, so I, I'd ask smart ass questions like that, you know, because he was saying, you know, when you, right. Um, I'd ask smart. And of course I already had read the thing on centripetal force and centripetal force. So I didn't, so I got, you know, like basically told I couldn't come back to that class. So I had to actually take that period to go and just self-study and pass the AP physics on my own, which I did, which was great because I basically got that period off in school. And so it worked out for me. It worked out for the principal, right? Um, or for, for the, for the teacher. But essentially the thing is that the ROI of being, um, like good at math plus fairly disobedient was not there for the first, you know, it, it started to increase as I got to academia. And, you know, at that time in the early 2000s, um, there was still some ROI for thinking different, right? But it was only when I got into technology that that actually really, there was a vector alignment for thinking different. Everything before, that's it's kind of the times were changing, decentralization was happening, right? The internet was happening. All of those things, the ROI on thinking different increased. And then, you know, like I actually, my, only, my, my first public speaking was actually at the ripe age of 33 in 2013. That was actually the first talk, the Silicon Valley's Ultimate Exit talk it was actually when I was 33. So obviously I'd been thinking about a lot of this stuff for a long time, but um, actually, you know, uh, I think Sam Altman, uh, you know, friend slash colleague of mine had a tweet, which is like, um, Something like the the best people spend ten years heads down before you ever hear of them, or something like that. I think there's sometimes truth to that, and sometimes not. I think it's totally reasonable to build your audience online. Say it's a different time. I think than when you know, even today, seven years or eight years after he tweeted that, it's like it's a different time than it was then, right? Um, but that's kind of what I did do. I I was heads down. I was offline. I was not building an audience online or anything like that for a long time. And so what happened was basically the ROI for disobedience just kept increasing, you know, like it went from extremely negative ROI where you basically get thrown out of class to like, uh, okay, it's tolerable when you get to college to skip class. And I was like, oh, you're not taking attendance. I have flex time now. Oh my God. That was a huge breakthrough in life. Holy moly. I could sleep in. I could just read the textbook. I never showed up to class. I would just show up to the midterm and the finals and basically just like do it that way. It was just way more efficient, right? What's the teacher going to say? They're going to speak. This is before we had 2X on YouTube and that concept, right? You, usually a teacher is speaking uh, too slowly. Sometimes they'd speak too fast, but with a textbook, I can just rewind and it's usually in better. It's like thought through better and so on and so forth. So I just didn't learn that well from listening to lectures, I, I learned much better from just reading the textbook and seeing it in writing and being able to do the problems myself. I could just move much, much, much faster that way. And so what I just do is I'd get uh, the textbook that was recommended for a given class, but I also get two or three others. And uh, the reason is then I could triangulate and I could, if you just kind of diff them, you could see, okay, these guys all kind of front page this particular formulation for electrostatics or something like that. And this is how they all talk about electrodynamics, but this part is idiosyncratic to this particular author who's stressing this problem that probably came from his research and it's not there in the other two textbooks. So it might not be as important. And you start to pull out with that. And of course that means reading not one, but like three physics textbooks or something, but it actually is sort of sometimes easier to do that than to read one right? Because you read the same concept and you have them open on a big table and you can read the same concept, a few different things. So, so the, the ROI for disobedience then kept increasing in academia. Now you could disobey a bit and write papers and then in entrepreneurship again. And then now once you get to venture capital and content production, originality is actually really, really, really valued. Right? What do you call it? Originality. You call it being disobedient. You call it being contrarian. You call it being whatever, whatever. Like, just that combination of being analytical plus not fully obedient has has been this important thing. But yeah, I don't think I I would not have predicted my career path back then, and the reason is 
I would have thought of, if someone had said something, they would have said, uh, okay, biology would be like a mathematician or, or something like that. That's, that's, that was the most tangible and legible thing, or maybe a writer. Um, because I was, you know, like good at English and, you know, all the type of stuff, right? Like whatever, you know, the, it, there's like CTY, like center for talented youth, all those kinds of tests. I would max out those tests. So you, you were precocious. It was clear from a young age that you were, yeah. 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 I, but but the thing is also remember this is the 80s and the 90s so there's no there's not really an outlet for that so I would max out all these standardized tests but but then what yeah yeah and then what right exactly like distance learning wasn't really that built up um, it, it just, th there wasn't anything like the accelerated learning network you have now it was extremely rate limited you go to third grade and you go to fourth grade then you go to fourth grade and then you go to fifth grade. And perhaps I could have skipped ahead, like whatever number of grades or something like that. But like the thing is that, you know, it's also about social development and not simply, you know, technical. And, you know, so like I did, I did skip a grade or whatever, but, you know, if I had skipped five grades, it was, you should be a weirdo then, right? Like, you know, you, 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 it's not something where you're socially integrated in the same way, even being like one grade or whatever, that was a thing, right? So, Anyway, point is that uh, society was not set up for acceleration then. It was absolutely set up for speed limit. And those speed limits have been falling away. This, by the way, is a phrase that um, there's an entrepreneur online who has this phrase. There's no such thing as a speed limit in entrepreneur. There's no speed limit. It's Derek, Derek Shivers, I think, is, is the guy, right? And basically what he means by that is in entrepreneurship, it's not like there's a homework problem and you do it and you're done. It's like, I've got 50 different things to do. And I can do them all in a day, and then I've got another fifty, right? I would I always think of it as, um, you know, it's it's a real time strategy game, not a turn based game. Like if if you're waiting for your turn, you're fucking it yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I wonder if there's anything that jumps out as formative to you, um, as you know, an author or a book or uh, movies or or anything like that that was just really like got in your mental DNA early and sort of helped shepherd you towards the path that you're on. Formative works. Um, well, I've mentioned some of them, but I'll, I'll you know, so Feynman Lectures on Physics, uh, From Third World to First um, by Lee Kuan Yew, The Man Who Knew Infinity by Robert Canigal that got later made into a movie. I actually liked uh, John Allen Paulus's Innumeracy. Um, I thought that was really good. Uh, when I was actually a kid, I liked Howl's Moving Castle and that whole series by Diana Wynne-Jones. Because I felt, uh, I haven't reread that in a long, long time, but I felt that they were kind of intricate plots that kind of rewarded reading where there was a payoff later to something earlier. Um, I haven't reread them as an adult, but, uh, you know, that was actually, th those are actually pretty good. I, I, I should remember the name of the book, but there's other kinds of books like that. I, I appreciated the ones that, just had a few threads and wrapped them all up together satisfyingly. I think some PG Wodehouse books are actually quite good. That he's popular in India. Um, these are fiction books. Um, obviously, I, you know, I liked Isaac Asimov and uh, you know stuff like that. I, you know, one thing is that I was as a kid and in my teens. You know, there's some people who are like, oh, you know, I was always a as a programmer, and I got a Mac early on. Was playing around with it. That was actually not me. I actually got into programming relatively late in my 20s or so. And I think I only really learned how to code properly. I mean, what I mean by that is I was always a math person and a science person in, in that sense. And um, computers were a tool that you used to, you know, I would, I'd use, you know, you'd write in MATLAB or you'd write in, uh, you'd write scientific code that was um, just different than just coding, you know, like apps, right? That was not something that I really cared about as much. I did care about science. And so academic code, as you're probably aware, academic mathematical code is terrible code, usually as code, because it's, it's a single player code. It's meant to generate a figure or a graph. It's not meant to power an application. So it's not easy to read or modify by anybody other than the person who's writing it. And so like multiplayer or multi-writer code is only something I really learned how to do after starting a company. 
Um, and that was like, you know, relatively late in life. So it's kind of, you know, computer science is a second or third language for me. Um, statistics and math is much more of like a first language. So, and so, you, you know, you, when you code, you kind of speak with an accent. So that's why I, I like functional programming because this is the way my brain works. I try to think of everything as f of g of h of x. And I just think, and I write down those functions and it just goes tuk, 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 like this, right? And, uh, you know, I, you can do, I can program in the imperative style and this style and that's, I can do all of that, whatever now, but just like what comes sort of naturally. Uh, there's probably something like that. If you look at people, I, I'm not a linguist, but if you were, and you looked at, let's say people who spoke Polish and then English, uh, versus people who spoke, I don't know, um, Hungarian and then English or Japanese, there's probably certain constructions that map cognitively to the source language from the destination language that are maybe more common with somebody coming from one linguistic background. So those are kind of formative works. Uh, the books that I have always liked are compendium books that pack a lot into a little, like, uh, you know, Princeton Companion of Mathematics. I've mentioned that before. Um, Gershenfeld's Elements of Mathematical Modeling. I've liked that. Um, you know, I, physics in math, you know, I like uh, I actually like Paul Tipler's early, you know, they're, they're, they're undergraduate books or, or, or AP physics books, but Paul Tipler's books on physics are pretty darn good, I thought. And Howard Anton's, you know, Calculus BC is, a, that's like a, that's like an easy book for high school, relatively easy, but it's pretty good still. It's well illustrated. And the, the, um, you know, it's a famous book, a Thomas Apostle's book, but I think that's actually harder to read. Uh, the kinds of other books I like, I liked, uh, you know, uh, visual complex analysis by I think Needham. That that was interesting because it actually drew graphics of things which normally you didn't see. I think a lot of Springer textbooks, the yellow textbooks, are needlessly hard to read because they eschew graphics too much, right? And especially in math, a picture can you know give a thousand words. One of the things I liked about statistics is that it was highly visual, and you could often debug yourself by looking at histograms and scatter plots and what have you. So stats was sort of math that I could test on the computer. That was the kind of thing that I did like. That was start with the kind of thing that got me into computers. And you started also seeing, one of the things I, I liked was um, I learned pretty quickly to not read the book, but to go straight to the examples at the back. Uh, basically just do the, in, in a good physics or math textbook or science textbook, you have these sort of boxes or problems that as you read through. And if you're an active reader, you stop and you try to do the problem before flipping the page, right? And um, you know what I would do, and what I still do, is uh, I would I would do that a lot, and I would actually skip over the text and just start to try to do the problems, and only go back and read the text if I couldn't do the problems. And uh, so it's like a placement test type of thing. It's like you know you you try you check if the device driver is installed before you go and install it. You know, and it's like a computer adaptive testing is like this. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to ask if you um, got that from Feynman, because I remember reading that he often kind of he would attempt his own approach and a few times stumbled on really novel ways to solve problems exactly because he would just start from a logic place, not following the playbook that he was just taught place. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he definitely did that. I mean, um, I think. Uh, so that is actually, that is true that that is good to do, but that's like for research, right? Where there isn't an answer in the back of the book. And I think that is good to do. The twist on that is even if you are learning something where there is a correct and known answer, it's easier to try to do it, fail, and then go and look up the documentation than to just read the documentation as if it was a novel and front to back before you start doing something. So start, then learn, then, start, you know, you have to basically learn while doing, otherwise it's not embedded into the process or whatever, right? And other kinds of formative works like this, Shaum's outlines, uh, you know, I love those because they have just tons of solved problems. You just learn by doing problems, you know? I have heard you mention this before that, you know, you kind of talk about doing math like, like that's a hobby, you know, somebody asks like, you know, what do you do in your free time? And you're like, I, I do math. Um, and I'm curious what that, what that looks like. Is that, is that you're going through Sean's outlines again? Is it, you're 
pulling raw data from places and just kind of like playing with it? Like, well, actually, I love actually pen and paper. And so I, what I do is I will, um, you know, as online as I am, I mentioned this actually in the book that you can be for the internal combustion engine, but that doesn't necessarily mean you want a car and highway everywhere, right? San Francisco, for example, famously had like an elevated highway near that was blocking the waterfront. And that was like an overbuild. It was an overuse of a good technology. And so pairing it back and having some nature was like the right equilibrium, right? Now, of course, they've messed up the waterfront in other ways, but for a period then it was actually nice. So in the same way, like pen and paper and just being offline um, with a with a printed out, you know, uh, like Shams kind of thing on a nice stand with some coffee is almost like meditation. It's very relaxing for me, at least. It's like, it's like basically, you know, it's like lifting weights, but it's like, you know, doing it, you know, where, where you just kind of keep your shelf sharp, like uh, Grimmett and Sturziker, for example, this, this is a kind of book I like, uh, here, here, like Grimmett and Sturziker, uh, 1000 exercises in probability, right? You know, it's just like, this is, this is evergreen content, right? Like learning how to just do, you know, a markup chain and just solve the eigenvalues. That will never, ever not be helpful, right? Versus reading some politics thing or whatever that is an extremely fast depreciating half-life, right? And so this stuff requires more energy to read, but it's also just good. It keeps you sharp or what have you. And, you know, the... um the kind of stuff actually, or stuff I like, I like uh, recently quantum.country or fast.ai, you know, those are great for like fast learning. And so I think, you know, the common theme here is I do like these technical books. And, and you know, the funny, it was funny, by the way, is most people when they say, oh, what's your favorite book? They'll almost always recommend like some fiction thing or sometimes a nonfiction thing. It's extremely rare that you'll see somebody mention a technical book, right? I, I, if I'm not mistaken, um, in many like interviews and so on. And I've always been surprised by that because I'm like, why isn't there a like New York review of books for technical books? Why doesn't that exist? Like, it's, it's like, it's this weird gap in the cultural sphere where made up stories, which are fine, by the way, they're fine. Made up stories are considered like, I, I, I shouldn't exactly say more prestigious because it's not like, um, it's not like people think math is not prestigious. They're, they're kind of intimidated by it or rather often, but it's just like off the grid as if it just doesn't even exist, you know? Yeah. They're, they're considered a utility almost. Is it a utility? It is, it is just not spoken of, you know, like, uh, it, it's, it's basically, it's considered so technical that it's not of mainstream appeal, I think is the right thing. Right. But you know, the funny thing is these kinds of books that win the Booker prize or art, art books or whatever, those are not really usually not written for the public at large a and B actually, you know, um, I've always actually been surprised by this, which is despite the relatively limited audience for technical books, many of them are actually a very high quality or perhaps Made not despite, because of the limited audience, they are of very high quality. There's like more. Anyway, this is just something that I've, I've, uh, I'm not sure I've got a formulation on it, but um, that's the type of stuff that I like as a, as a kid in the teens. Once I got into my twenties, um, I was more involved with writing papers and less with reading books as such. And one of the things I started to do is I always had to have some broad vector where different kinds of books would get mapped onto that because I'm my brain is sort of single threaded in this way, which is a funny thing for say, because you might think I'm very digressive and I've got lots of different things I hop around on. But it's single threaded in the sense of I've got some sort of direction vector and theory of history. And all the stuff kind of slots in and maps to that and whatnot. And if I can't fit something in, then I tend to not remember it. Um, it's like an example of theorem X or a corollary to postulate Y, then I can remember it. But if it's like just a random date of the Peloponnesian War, I won't remember it unless it's 
in series with something else that I need to remember as an input to something else, you know? So I have this clothesline on which I hang things, and that's almost like a form of data compression. Um, a little bit like how, you know, people talk about narrative journalism. You have a narrative, and then every story is like, uh, it's, it's just like um, an episode of the same series, and people know the characters, they know who's good, they know who's bad, and then the the story itself is just an episode in this in this long running series. That's narrative journalism. I have something that's sort of like that, but it's like a long run theory. And you know, you see Lee Kuan Yew zero to one, and you've got this mental model of the world. One other thing, you know, basically that uh, that's kind of relates to this. I think about is do you know the concept of referential integrity in a database? Let's say you go to Facebook or whatever, and you update your name here. You expect that, um, you know, in another part of the app, your name will get updated, right? And uh, the way that's happening under the hood is there's something called referential integrity in a database where when a, when a, uh, a row of a table is updated, um, it doesn't get out of sync. All the pointers still point to the right thing and so on. Especially if you like, for example, if you change your email, all this stuff now has to change its pointers or whatever. So... I actually sort of, the kind of thing I lie awake at night and I think about it, I was like, okay, here's what I've learned today. How does that fit into my overall model? Where are the contradictions? Let me line it up and so on and so forth. It's a miracle you ever sleep. No, no, no. Well, <laughs> I mean, this is just the kind of stuff I'm just like, uh, yeah. does that fit? That doesn't yeah. fit. Yeah. And the stuff that the stuff that is like, the stuff that's most interesting to me is the stuff that I think is important, but I haven't fit into that model. It's like a piece of the puzzle that hasn't snapped into place. And uh, whereas the stuff that is like, I don't know, how to how to sew or something like that, I don't need to learn that. I can I can delegate that to like a sewing robot or what have you. I don't need to, it's cool. I might watch a video on it or something, but I don't need to actually include that. The reason I bring up the referential integrity piece is I, I realized later on in life that most people do not care to do that and they just compartmentalize. Meaning they will, maybe they'll learn something, but they won't try to propagate it through and be like, does this knock down these other 15 things that I've been thinking about, you know? And, you know, the interesting thing about that later that served me fairly well in life in a very unexpected way, uh, thanks to actually um, Kim Kardashian of all people made a comment that actually illustrates this. Why? She said, on social media, the most important things are authenticity and consistency, right? And, you know, the thing is that because I think I have a fairly consistent philosophical framework, I've kind of been saying not the same thing, but like the same themes since I've been in the public's, you know, eye, like since 2013 or what have you, right? Um, I'm not saying there haven't been things that have changed there, you know, like my estimation of you know, how neutral tech companies are, or whatever. A lot of these things have changed, don't get me wrong. But the fundamental, I think, theme is pretty consistent over, over a period of time. And that comes from referential integrity. And I actually think that, uh, you know, it, it interacted with the Kardashian point in an important way, which is when people follow you on Twitter, it is different than being your friend in WhatsApp. Why? Your friend is there for the person, but the person on Twitter is there for like the intellectual product. It's as if they're buying a carton of milk or a gallon of orange juice. They're kind of subscribing for a feed of certain things. They don't usually want to hear about, quote, the person themselves, unless that's like a celebrity for whom their personal drama is actually part of the product or whatever, right? And I'm not saying that people, there's obviously some overlap or whatever there, but my natural disposition is to not talk that much about like personal stuff. You're, you're actually making me talk about it more than I normally do or think about. Um, it's to talk about broader concepts. And also because I'm doing this referential integrity thing, I'm consistent over a long time. So that has actually helped buttress the social media thing in a way that I never actually expected. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, you've got a consistent base and you have a consistent product. And that actually leads to an overall consistency of experience which was not actually the ambition at the beginning. It was just a byproduct. Um, I, I would love to, um, I'm going to ask one more question about media and then uh, that's a perfect sort of pivot point. I knew that the Feynman lectures was going to be the first thing out of your mouth when I asked that question. Um, 
Because you've heard me say it a few times. So I yeah. have I, <laughs> a couple. I want to I want to drill down into that one a little bit. Do you remember um, sort of what age you were when you picked that up, and really what fifteen you, or sixteen? Okay, what you uh, took away from it, or what the impact was on you? I mean, it's the technical stuff, which is like, you know, for example, Feynman makes a point that it's easy to ask why and really hard to get the answer. You know, why is the sky blue? Uh, okay, you can you can give a technical answer, which is it's something related to Rayleigh scattering. And um, if you, uh, there's a famous book um, by Jackson, uh, Electricity and Magnetism, um, or actually uh, Classical Electrodynamics, I think. Um, uh, I forget which one it is. It's either Classical Electrodynamics or it's one of Jackson's books where he actually goes through, you know, this, and you need to actually know something about atmospheric composition and, you know, Rayleigh scattering, whatever. Uh, it's just like a really easy question to ask and a really hard question to answer, right? It's just, the reason I just point to this is, this always stuck in my head as, this. remember the thing I was saying, like single threaded, you know? I, I haven't picked up Jackson in a very long time, but I do remember that that stuck in my head as a great example of a very complicated answer to a seemingly simple question. But that really is sort of irreducibly complicated, right? So that was one thing I took away from the final lectures. Um, you know, I, I like the concept of the cargo cult learning and how people would just repeat things without the internal process in their head. Like, his ex, I think the example from, actually, that was from Shirley or Joking, Mr. Feynman, I think, like the, the, the kids in Brazil or whatever. I think the overall thing I took away from just Feynman's oeuvre, uh, both his stories and the stories about him or what have you, that it was actually off diagonal in an interesting way. In American culture, it is assumed that, especially at that time, less so today, but certainly then, um, is assumed that either someone was dominant and physical, aka jock, or they were submissive and intellectual, aka nerd. And that those two correlated and it was like a diagonal kind of thing. Whereas Feynman was assertive and intellectual, right? So he was, he definitely was not, you remember my thing about disobedient or whatever, right? He was absolutely not a shrinking violent. He was not a nerd in any typical sense, right? In the sense of someone who is like submissive. And when you say jock and nerd, that's the kind of thing that's portrayed in like Back to the Future or Revenge of the Nerds. It's like a... It's a sort of uh, thing that's on TV that people start mapping things to. Whereas the tech CEO is not a typical nerd because see, a CEO is a leader of men, right? Like that's that's something which is a not a position of getting pushed into a locker, but the person who's like leading the charge. So wait a second, that's an inversion. That doesn't fit the TV diet of the kind of person who's supposed to exist, right? And Feynman showed you know, that you could break out of that. And how could you break out of that? You could break out of that as a academic. And so that was sort of the vector that, I, I'm not sure I was as explicit about that as I am now. Right now I can kind of see that consciously because I can map that to a trajectory of academic and then entrepreneur and then like, you know, independent and so on and so forth. And I can see that trajectory of returns on disobedience, okay? Or, or returns on intellectual assertiveness, right? Or just whatever you want to call it. And, you know, to be clear, by the way, I uh, one thing, I would not call myself like, quote, disobedient or nonconformist or contrarian for the sake of being so. It is that if I see that something I, I disagree with or I think of as irrational or incompetent, then I will push against it hard and disrespect it and or work around it, et cetera. But I'm happy to work with or defer to people who I think of as better than me in a given area, of which there are very many, right? And so it is it is not a reaction against order, but against irrational and or incompetent order. And if someone can do it better than I can, I won't resist that at all. I'll be like happily amazed. I'm, I respect that they did it. I'm glad they did it. I'm glad I don't have to think about it and so on and so forth. So I would just, I want to qualify the disobedient thing with saying it's not I would consider the juvenile anarchism. That's, it was never, it was just that I thought something was being done poorly and that it could be done better. Now there's an overlap between, so that's, I understand something of the anarchist because of that, because I understand the rebellion against order. But I also understand, I think something of the, of the statist 
which is the, you know, like the value of an operating hierarchy. You kind of, you start to understand something of both, you know, a funny, let me give you a totally different reference that I haven't talked about maybe that much or whatever. Um, I was never a big match, actually not never. I was never into magic gathering. I don't even actually know how to fully play it. I don't think, but there is this really great post, um, on medium that is extremely well written. And what I mean by that is it's like so well written that the selection of the words is almost like an omakase, you know, like a chef's menu or something, which is a high compliment, you know, like it, this is not your typical workmanlike kind of post. It's something where every word is like very well chosen. And this uh, post is basically about, um, you know, essentially what you might call the alignment system, but in magic gathering, like white, blue, black, red, and green. And just to describe this for a second, since you asked about formative things, in the magic gathering system, white is like law and order, blue is knowledge, black is selfishness, but also capitalism, independence, etc. Red is chaos, passion, fire, and green is like nature and harmony and what have you. Okay. And, you know, as a sort of professional journey, I started out as blue, as just like pure math, knowledge, what have you. And, uh, you know, that's like the the scientist or technologist. And then I became blue black because the tech founder is um, basically you, you, you add capitalism to it, right? Because now you have markets and stuff. So blue black is that. And then when you have, when you become, go from a tech founder to someone running an organization, the tech CEO or the tech executive, now you are blue, black, and white, where you have some of the um, capitalism and markets, but also some of the order and law of white, right? And then um, red is when you start getting it, when I started getting into social media, I learned, uh, you know, to a greater extent, like, you know, infusing things with passion, emotion, like, you know, I have this article, like the purpose of technology, where I sort of realized that I love that article. we were making, yep. right? So the thing about that is you, you sort of realize that we have left a whole way of kind of explaining what we're doing, which is often actually the motivating thing. Why are you doing self-driving cars? Because, you know, people are needlessly dying, right? Why are we, you know, doing... Um, uh, you know, biomedicine, because, uh, you know, we should have limb regeneration. People shouldn't, you know, like be missing limbs and war or something, landmines. We should be able to regenerate that. You know, it, it is possible to do that with stem cells. We just haven't figured it out yet because we know that you can generate them from scratch in the first place, right? You know, that planaria, whatever, things can do it. So the thing about that is I learned, okay, we need to add emotion, which is actually not always a great thing it's a, it's a very, it's like fire. It's, it's good in a, in a fireplace. It's good when it's channeled. It's bad if it's not there, but it's also bad if it's out of control. It's easy for it to go out of control. So red is a good color for that. It's fire, right? It's that passion. It's that emotion and so on. And what's funny is the journos probably see me primarily through that lens, right? Because what I learned was that you could not make a rational argument with them. You could try they would misrepresent it and they would demagogue you and they would quote you out of context and they would attack you. And it was just foolish to approach them in good faith because they were fundamentally intellectual slash economic or economic slash intellectual slash spiritual competitors, right? You know, for whether we are all bolted down to the ground and submitting to this, you know, like horrible U.S. establishment or whether we are ascending to the stars, right? That's a much longer conversation, but it's essentially something that you just sort of learned over the 2010s that these folks cannot be reasoned with. So you meet them on the same domain of emotion and you realize that like, you actually need to make those emotional appeals and uh, that that's actually not incompatible with the logical appeals, that it actually buttresses it. It is the combination of left and right brain. And this is actually the same thing that a tech CEO does when you're, quote, firing up the troops. Like Elon is backup humanity, but he's also figuring out all the calculations to go and do that, right? It is, you know, the missionary 
but it's it's not missionary versus mercenary. It's missionary plus market. You know, you you have both concepts. You have the practical. Uh, so going back to the original concept, the practical ideologue, right? Implicitly, that passion drove what I was doing. But I realized that actually there was a way of articulating that more publicly and showing that we're not just in it for quote the money and so on. And if you notice, for example, and this took me a while to realize. It is good that there's funding rounds and all that type of stuff. It is bad that people call it the tech industry. Why? Because that actually, that's a label that we kind of accept and so on. I'm sure I've used it in the past, whatever, right? But it's actually bad because, like, you know, it is it is like uh you would not call it the physics industry, right? That actually sort of kind of kind of demeans it, right? Because I mean the the business is simply a vehicle to push the future and drive us forward in, in human progress. Whether that is accomplished via an open source project or an academic paper or a research lab, the tool doesn't matter as much as like the goal of like advancing technology, right? You build a better steam engine, it you know, it may turn out that the best way of doing that is with a capitalist vehicle, but nowadays it could be done with a perhaps an on-chain thing, a community crowdfund. The 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 tool is less important than the goal. So, you know, I was able to learn red relatively. That wasn't that hard. The hardest thing for me to learn was green. Green was the very hardest thing for me to learn because, you know, I started at blue and got to black and then got to white. And then, you know, when I was doing more public communication, got to red. Green is like the least natural way for me to operate. Why? Because green in the magic uh, gathering thing is like unchanging, you know, it is harmony with nature. It is often anarcho-primitivist or, you know, what have you. And I couldn't understand it for the longest time until uh, I, I did actually come up with something. And then I realized, okay, this does map to it. You know what maps to green? Decentralization. Right? Why? Because they are like the, this color, this whole post is good to read because the, the things are positioned all in this kind of, uh, Pentagon for a reason. It's because the things that they're opposite and adjacent to have certain interesting interactions. For example, W, you know, the the white color is opposite chaos R and capitalism B. So it's opposite both chaos and selfishness, right? Knowledge, the U, is opposite from harmony and freedom because it's like U is like science and G is nature. U is uh, logic and R is emotion, right? Um, B, you know, selfishness is opposite. Of course, it's opposite, like uh, you know, the the law or or socialism or what have you. But it's also opposite, quote nature, because oh, it's oil executive versus like you know the the you know natural habitat, etc. But what's cool about the magic gathering thing is sometimes you can take opposites and actually turn them into something that makes sense. For example, if you scroll a fair bit of the way down the page, you will see, yeah, you, so for example, uh, control F for, although the enemy colors are defined by their disagreement, they can also have a harmony of their own. So although the enemy colors, see if you get there. So if W is the group and B is the individual, the Hegelian synthesis is the tribe. So it's not everybody, but it's not, just one person, both B and W can kind of agree that the tribe is a synthesis there. You see what I'm saying, right? Or if you take U and R, um, U is knowledge and R is passion, and then the the hybrid is creativity. And so this it's actually a very well thought through system. And that's why I mean that the word choice here is very good because it kind of like nails something that has aspects of both, right? And so the thing is that um, green and black, how do you marry nature and selfishness? Well, that's like natural selection, right? Nature, red and tooth and claw is nature, but it's also selfish and it's like natural, but you see what I'm saying, right? So you, there's actually these interesting hybrids there of things that are often opposed. And what I realized was Bitcoin is blue, black, and green, okay? Let's say it doesn't have the law 
and it's like almost in, intrinsically anti-government and it's highly logical, right? So it doesn't have the W and the R components. The blue is, of course, the encryption. The black is the capitalism. But the green is the decentralization because when you kind of read what the green colored people are writing, these are NGOs and nonprofits and you know so on and so forth. They value nature, but they also don't like the capitalist control, right? They don't want that CEO to have control over them. And so you put yourself into the rebel mindset again. You're like, okay, I actually do understand this. You know, for example, another version of green blue is open source. It's knowledge, you know, um, so it's blue. And you could argue green, blue, black is also open source because companies will sometimes open source something as an enlightened self-interest thing. They're building a coalition across those people who want everything to be free and those people who want free promotion. That's like a green, black kind of thing. And... There's another aspect of green red that took me a long, long time to understand, which is they really prize authenticity where blue and black prize growth mindset. So growth mindset, what does that mean? Growth mindset is you're always learning. You're always earning, right? I'm leveling up. I'm learning new math stuff. I'm, you know, I'm not just uh, hanging out. Oh, are they starting a company? Okay. Let me just put in a check, right? Might as well get a level up while we're doing it. Get that mushroom, get that, this, you're always leveling up, you know, you're lifting weights, you're optimizing this, et cetera, et cetera. That is, I think, the naturally sort of transhumanist optimalism mindset. In fact, if you um, control F transhumanism here, you know, you'll see transhumanism is a fundamentally blue-black worldview in opposition with the green imperative to accept death as a crucial, inevitable part of life. Okay. So once you can actually start like kind of getting people's magic gathering colors, you can actually sometimes start predicting them. This is sort of like um, Myers-Briggs, it's like a different slice. It's got some overlap with that, right? And green and red have something in common, which is the opposite of blue and black. If blue and black are about growth mindset, green and red are about authenticity. Okay. Authenticity. What is that? That's like an old growth breadwood that never changes, right? Authenticity. That's for the green version. Authenticity for red is from the heart. You know, they're not faking, it, right? It's, it's genuine. And it's like, you know, they want people to just remain the same all the time, et cetera. And then I was actually able to turn it and understand it from a different standpoint, which is authenticity for them is like trustworthiness, right? It is not so much that they, it's not so much that they want people to remain the same all the time. There's just part of it, but it is that if something is the same every time, then it is something they can rely on to be there. It's always there as opposed to the big box store that comes in and changes everything or the scientist that, you know, like overturns things and doesn't care about our traditions and what have you, right? Like that's where the red green is coming from. And once I can sort of understand it in a logical way, I can start negotiating a reasonable outcome. That's a win-win. You know what I mean? Right? So I'm like, okay, they want authenticity. Well, you know what? We can actually do cryptographic authenticity, right? Um, they want authenticity. So that means actually it's related to the earlier Cardassian point of authenticity and consistency, right? Um, I understand why they want that because they want to believe that you are the same person that you were. So why don't I do on-chain proof so they can show that I didn't just say that I donated, but that I did donate. And, and so just stuff like that where you're like, look, if there's a way to meet that person halfway and do a win-win without compromising your own values, let's do that, right? So that's that's the kind of stuff when you talk about- form Communicating in a way that they accept and appreciate the message and, and are excited to interact with it. Yes, and, and often doing something or giving on some dimension that isn't actually necessarily always that important to you, but they're like super important to them. For example, if a company is doing a collaboration with an academic, what's super important to the academic is whether they're like first author or last author, but that doesn't matter to the company at all. So that's an easy gift, you know? Um, what matters to both is the budget. What matters to the company is actually just that it's published and not so much that it's like the most prestigious thing or whatever out there. Like they don't care about the prestige ladder as much as the academic does, you know? That's a reasonable publication is good. Prestige is fine, but it's not, right? So Sometimes if you've got something that the other party really, really cares about that you don't care about that much, it's an easy give, makes both parties happy. And so this kind of stuff is the 
complement to the other stuff I was talking about. The other stuff I was talking about, the science stuff, the math stuff, that's all solo tools, right? Those are tools for understanding nature as it is, understanding the compiler, et cetera. And then the ones I've just talked about are social tools, right? Let me maybe round it out. I'll talk about some sort of programming books or whatever that I've liked. I thought that the Pearl Cookbook uh, and various updates of that are really good. Um, the Pearl Cookbook itself is obviously out of date because people don't you know, use Pearl anymore. But there's this site called PLEAC, uh, which is Programming La Language Examples Alike Cookbook, right? And what is the concept here? Well, the Pearl Cookbook pioneered the style of basically saying, how does a programmer actually work? You want to go and kind of look up how to do something. And then you kind of, you know, how do I do a for loop? How do I read a file and print out the lines? How do I do X? How do I make a you know, array of file handles or whatever? What's cool about this site, if you click it, you'll see uh, it's got various, you know, the same problems are translated into a bunch of different languages, right? So Perl, Groovy, and OCaml are 100% done, you know, but like Go is at 0.29%. I think this was like an early 2010s thing or 2000s thing that got reasonably far, but um, with Stack Overflow, it somewhat dropped off. But this is the kind of thing, which is the analog of like the Shams, you know, kind of thing where you, you kind of learn something from it. This is also like, I thought, a surprisingly good programming book, which will teach you something about testing bigger applications, like uh, test-driven development with Python Obey the Testing Goat. It's got a funny name, but it's like really, really good. It's really good. Uh, and the reason is it just sort of teaches you how to test things that are bigger than just a simple function. And it will make if you if you code Python applications of any scale, it'll make your coding better there. I think one of the wonders of your career and story is that you have maintained, as you said, an authentic sort of message and mission across a number of different, uh, I don't know, gardens for lack of a better term, like from academia to entrepreneurship to independence, as you say. And it, it sounds like Feynman was sort of an early model for academia. Um, and, and led you in that direction. Did you have similar models uh, or inspiration for the transition to entrepreneurship and then the transition from entrepreneurship into independence, as you say? So Feynman and Ramanujan were probably, they were impactful, but I don't think I read them and I was like, oh, I want to be a professor or something like that. I, I, that, that wasn't actually how I was thinking about it. It was basically more that I was like, what is the hardest thing you could do? And uh, so I was like, well, I could be, uh, in, in my early 20s, I thought that was being a professor at a uh, top, like, te you know, MIT or Stanford or something like that. And that was the track that I was on. And I, the reason why, I liked it is- Why were you driven to do the hardest thing you could? Why was I driven to that? Yeah, why, why was that the, the, like the instinct? Because I just like, I didn't feel I was progressing or challenging myself or doing something if I didn't do that. Like, I don't know, even, even like, you know, when playing sports or something like that, I, I gravitated towards, I, I like basketball or weightlifting, what, weightlifting, why you, there's progress with it, right? Running, you can time yourself and you can see progress, right? Basketball, you can be like, okay, I'm going to make 10 shots before I go home. And, and you can do it solo, right? Whereas football or soccer or something, you can obviously kick the ball in the net. It's, you know, you kind of need somebody on their side to give you a sense of progress. And it, it's not digital in the same way, right? So basketball is kind of like the best solo kind of thing, right? I think. I don't know. I mean, like, you know, you're right that actually it's perhaps it's idiosyncratic. You know, the opposite of that is let me make the most money for doing the least that I have to do. And that's 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 actually in a sense much more quote rational, right? So that's what I mean about kind of being a pragmatic ideologue is there's this sort of rationality engine, but there's sort of a I don't know, irrational or meta-rational direction, right? One other thing I would just say about that is it was in the early 2000s that actually it became more obvious that it was possible. See, like Gates and Jobs, you know, people kind of knew who they were in the um, in the 90s and and so on, but it wasn't clear that you could become like them, 
that was the part that was, there really wasn't a path for that. It was like saying you could become LeBron James. Okay, maybe if you're like an amazingly talented high school, you know, basketball player, you could become LeBron James. But most people will kind of know whether they've got a shot at that very, you know, very soon. And, uh, or actually it was even more abstract than that because with LeBron James, you, people knew what the path was. Play in the high school, play in the NBA, or play in college and play in the NBA, right? To become Gates or Jobs, no one even knew where to start. It wasn't even like a realistic ambition. It was like, become an inventor. How are you going to do that? Okay, I, I, need, I need to get a lab. I need to learn electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. Like, there's just not something that there was, there's a process to, to do. And it was in the early 2000s that entrepreneurship, it, certainly Y Combinator is a big contributor to this, the coverage of Zuck and of Page and Bryn, the profusion of open source, all that stuff contributed to kind of making the concept accessible. Even if you didn't go through Y Combinator, if you, it was less like it was in the air as something that could be done right? The accessibility of it increased. And so then that opened up another door, which was, okay, the hardest thing you could do is actually build and sell a company, right? And now, you know, I look at that and I'm like, I I'm glad that I climbed that hill at that time and so on. But it's also something where just starting a company for its own sake is never something I could do. I have to do something where there's a meaning to it, like, you know, uh, whether that's cryptocurrency, uh, which I think of as very meaningful or biomedicine, like there has to be, there has to be like a, like a, like a purpose there. And, um, a, a purpose that goes back to your, your clothesline of like technology and humanity co co Yeah. The clothesline, yeah. the clothesline, right? Yeah. So get, getting to life extension, getting to transhumanism, obviously genomics is, you know, like important. You need to understand the human body in order to get there. We need to have a billion personal genomes. That's, a really crucial and important thing. We need people to uh, actually use genomics in medicine. We're starting to see that now with like CRISPR and um, you know, like gene therapies and stuff. It's all starting to work. We were just about to transition into your, the, like the the section on career, which is a word I hesitated to use. So I I want to start with like, what do you consider your career or your body of work, or how do you how do you think about that? I sort of think of at each sort of stage of life, I have kind of built up some skill and then used that to get another skill, which I didn't start completely at zero and it built from the previous one. For example, you know, so I was naturally inclined towards math and science in school. And so that eventually got me into academic science. And when I started doing academic science, I, you know, developed the skill of giving slide presentations. Okay. And that in turn, um, translated relatively well into making pitch decks and that translated well into evaluating pitch decks as an investor and a VC, because I knew what kind of went into them on the other side of it. Right. And, uh, you know, the academic computer science code that I had to write for, for my research translated into production bioinformatics code for doing you know, base calling and things like that. And that translated into just understanding how to architect a commercial system, right? And so each step was like a lily pad hop where I leveraged everything I did know to not jump all the way into, you know, something totally unfamiliar, but to make that next step, right? And, you know, for example, like my, you know, giving those pitch decks, well, basically like my Y Combinator talk, like that first kind of public talk, um, and obviously, I've done academic talks and stuff before, but that YC talk in 2013 was basically a, like a pitch deck or a slide deck. The kind of content that I started putting out on Twitter was uh, related to the types of stuff that I, you know, it, it, it was actually, you know, I, if you look at my old tweets, you have that whole old archive, actually fairly technical-ish kind of content, not, not extremely so, but... Um, it was kind of from my area of, of strength, right? And uh, so essentially my public speaking built public writing. And then over time, I became, I learned enough Twitter or what have you, the conventions of Twitter. For example, before coming into Twitter, uh, you would not be able to necessarily guess whether it'd be considered um, 
taboo to self retweet or like is it is it a faux pas to like a tweet about yourself or not right you would not know whether that was a faux pas or not right and the convention is it's like oh someone says something nice you kind of fave as a thumbs up right that's become a convention and it's just like a you know hey i see you thank you and even if everybody else sees that they don't think it's like super weird or whatever for you to do that you could imagine a different social environment where uh, you, you're, you know, you're, you're forced not to disagree. To, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, forced to disagree, or you're not supposed to, you know, like, you know, thumbs up your own stuff or, or, or something like that, right? The thing is that basically each step kind of led to the next and in kind of an intentional way where you want to deliver value from what you know, right? You immediately deliver value from your base. And then the thing that you don't know that well yet, you just build up that skill, right? So, you know, the, from those slide decks and stuff, I basically, quote, learned to be, you know, so it became, you know, a public speaker. Not that I was kind of naturally inclined to that, but, you know, at least I actually did it. And then uh, from the tweeting, that actually got me more familiarity with just, for lack, back, lack of a better term, mass politics, you know, like, because you kind of are like a political leader when you've, because you have an audience and you kind of have to know what their mindset is. You have to have kind of, one, you know, you have to have a mental model of where the public is, right? Current events and so on. Public speaking is, quote, know your audience. And your audience shifts over time. And the kinds of things that are uppermost in their minds, um, you can sort of see it from the rest of the feed. And all of that kind of goes into your computation of, you know, what tweet, because um, you only have 280 characters, what tweet is consistent with all your values, but that also kind of references current events or or past events in a way that your audience gets. Like if I was tweeting in Turkish or in, you know, something like that, that my audience would be like, what the heck? And no one would like it because none of my followers speak Turkish or maybe some of them do, but not, not a huge number, right? That's, that's an obvious example. Uh, and then, you know, for example, going from academia into genomics entrepreneurship and then from that into VC and, uh, you know, then into cryptocurrency, like the, each step compounds. And now today I'm kind of pulling together a lot of different threads because the um obviously being an executive in cryptocurrency being an investor being uh you know a public speaker or writer also actually a lot of if you look at the pdf version of the network state a lot of that draws on kind of writing an academic paper like the degree of footnoting and you know all that type of stuff that's like an academic like latex like paper is like built in latex i set up a whole pipeline for that just like i was writing an academic paper so so that's how i kind of think about it is each thing is like a step to, you know, stepping stone to the next thing, and it's a lily path because sometimes, or it's like a lily pad, and you know, like the frog, you know, jumps on the lily pads, and you might fall in the drink at any one time, right? And importantly, by the way, what I'm never trying to do is like, oh, my next step is to get drafted in the NBA, okay? Like you, you have to have a realistic sense of one's own strengths and weaknesses and what that realistic next step is, you know. You know, when you're first starting a company, your realistic next step is not raise a billion dollars, right? Perhaps that's a realistic next step for me now, okay? But that was not a realistic next step for me 10 years ago, right? And so at each step, you have to kind of be ambitious, but not unrealistic, and your own biggest booster and your own biggest critic, if that makes any sense, you know? You you basically just have to have both of those, like incredible degrees of realism about one's own strengths and weaknesses, and then the realistic ambition on top of that, and then also work with others who, who complement one's strengths and weaknesses. Okay. So that's, that's how I think about like career at an abstract level in the concrete. Um, so you asked what accomplishments am I proud of, proudest of so far, you know, there, let's call it, there's, 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 let's say three buckets of accomplishments, those that are not legible um, to the world, those that are legible and based on traditional credentials and those that are legible and based on, let's call them, you know, bottom up credentials, right? So for example, a bottom up credential is founded a company, sold a company, CTO of a $10 billion, you know, company that was just started, right? You know, angel investor where take my own money and turning that into a lot of money. Those are bottom up credentials, right? A top-down credential is like taught at Stanford or, um, you know, named to the MIT Tech Review or something like that, right? Both of those are legible, but 
the the first appeals to sort of the tech bootstrappy audience because you know even if you are on the other side of the world you're like okay i get that i might not be able to get to a university but i can look at you know uh, what this person has done from for, on their on their own and it's not based on an institutional imprimatur it's based on them building the thing from scratch right and the second is the top down where an establishment person is like okay I understand that contest. I understand that credential. And so I can understand that in terms of conventional creds, okay, MIT this, Stanford that, and check the box. And then there's the third group, which is this type of stuff that's not legible to the broader world, but it's like, you know, the guys that you worked with are like, okay, yeah, you really showed a lot of grit in this extremely difficult situation. Um, And you turned this thing around or you persisted when others would have quit. Or you, you know, you were able to steer us through a difficult time, right? And that's not something that I can cleanly articulate as an MIT this or a Stanford that or an exit of this amount or an invest, you know, right? But those would be the kind of the three buckets. And in those buckets, you know, I, I, I do actually think that the network state is probably the thing I'm the proudest of, actually. You know, or like, but but I also think it's still at the base of the exponential. You know, hopefully I have another whatever number of decades and everything I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I hope still compounding. That's because I'm not like a consumption person. I'm a production person. I'm not like burning capital on suits and, you know, stuff like that. Right. Everything is just going into the next compounding, not just, not, not like, not in a money sense necessarily though, you know, of course money is an important, you know, piece of the puzzle, important tool, but like, the knowledge builds another knowledge, builds another knowledge, and so on and so forth. And you know, you can work sustainable seventy-hour weeks if you sleep whenever you want, wake up whenever you want, work out when you want, work when you want, and never travel and have basically like I only do meetings like one day a week, right? And so then the rest of the week I have totally free, and I can just do something spontaneously like this, or I decide not to do that, or whatever, right? So I do think the network state is probably the one I'm the proudest of so far. Because I do feel that was kind of a zero to one thing. I think that's going to have maybe lasting. Ask me again in a year, and it'll probably be the network state hardcover. Um, and then maybe, uh, you know, what, what I haven't announced yet, but some of the stuff that's coming with the network state. Um, in the long, in, in 10 years, it, it would hopefully be helping get the first network state started. And in 20 years, it might be actually unblocking biomedicine and getting to life extension and, and whatnot, right? So, that's that's kind of how I think about it. Then your other question, or go ahead, I'll pause there. I was going to go to your next question. There's a, a compliment to that, which is that I'm curious about, which is what is the, what was probably the darkest or biggest struggle uh, sort of along the way to where you are so far? Oh, man. Like, see, the thing is, I want to, I, I sort of want to talk about this in the abstract rather than the concrete. And the reason is, you know, Ben likes to write these books. I mean, like the hard thing about hard things and so on. He'll write this book about like all the gory details of the various failures and so on and so forth. And the reason he can do that is he's so wildly successful that everybody knows how the hero's journey plays out. And that's why they're listening to him and so on and so forth. The lessons that he drew from those failures are clearly valuable lessons because they led to his success. Whereas others who failed and never succeeded, whatever, how they were summarizing it, you're not even sure that they would be summarizing it in a, in a useful way. They may have drawn the totally wrong lessons from their failures because they never succeeded after that, right? So, you know, that's why like people talking about failure, they can do so from the vantage point of extreme success. Then you can talk about failure, Right. So when Ben had like totally, you know, I'm talking about Ben Horowitz, you know, of Andrew Snorowitz, right? My my friend slash mentor slash, you know, colleague, um, someone I, I I respect a great deal. And so what I, here's what I would say. You know, people will say, oh, you know, I'm going to do a startup. Willing something into existence is, uh, you know, Elon has a saying, it's like eating broken glass and staring into the abyss, right? The reason for that is, there's no but there's no place to hide you know there's you know the the buck stops there you cannot blame somebody else you just have to figure it out and there is no safety net like your company will die and 
uh, you know, everything will go to zero. You'll be humiliated in public by all these people who are um, essentially haters that they also hate themselves, though. Right. They basically all these folks who are rooting for somebody else's failure, they want to know that. Uh, they themselves didn't fail, usually. Right. Meaning, well, they didn't try. They didn't risk it. And haha, look at they were actually smart to not try. Right. There's an interesting thing. You know, there's something actually very common between or something in common, rather, between the very docile and the very cynical. And you know what that is? They never do anything. Exactly. Neither of them ever make a bold move. Okay. It's a really interesting point where the really cynical, they think of themselves as smart, but they've become so cynical that they're actually uh, de facto risk averse, right? They, they basically cannot make a calculated bet because they've convinced themselves with whatever thing that it's going to fail, right? So you kind of need some degree of idealism or determination or something that is this uh, je ne sais quoi. That's why I said, you know, at the beginning, you asked me, you know, as a pragmatic ideologue. So basically, another way of putting it is you cannot be purely economically motivated, at least I couldn't, in, in doing a startup, because there are many times in the middle of it that the rational thing to do is quit. The rational thing to do is quit and just go and have like a decent job at a Google or whatever, and they'll pay you well. And you don't have a lot of responsibility and you can do interesting math and so on and so forth. And this, look, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm sure a lot of people listening to have a job like that and that's totally cool. And, you know, that's good. And in fact, like if you're a rational human being, you know, it, it, that's <laughs> it's probably a pretty good thing to do. Right. You know, but if you the only reason to do a startup is if you need to build something you can't buy. You know, like Elon cannot build, buy a trip to Mars, right? Why am I doing this? Because to get to something like life extension, to get to, to unlock all that biomedicine, as I mentioned, you need, to, you need to solve the sovereignty problem, all this type of stuff, right? There's that long-term path that we need to get to. The, the super soldier serum type stuff, all that stuff, all of these breakthroughs for humanity. I mean, people talk about universal healthcare, as I mentioned, and they think they're idealistic. And then you poke them, you're like, universal healthcare is great. What about, you know, eternal life, life extension? They're like, oh, that's impractical. I'm like, oh, interesting, interesting. And really, actually, you know, the, the, the poke on that is the person who's in favor of, quote, universal healthcare really just wants the power to be able to move the mashed potatoes around the plate, does not actually want to actually solve the problem of increasing people's life. Because the moment you get, you get on that, they're like, well, there's dignity in death or whatever. I'm like, you were just crying a minute ago over the fact that life, extension, life expectancy dropped by like two years. You were like really weeping about that. And now suddenly you're telling me that it's like, okay to die. It's not a big deal, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, you can often crash somebody's operating system with an observation like this because they really do feel in the moment they're outraged, blah, blah, blah. But then you get them on this and you kind of, you take their premise and you actually extend it. And then, you know, they'll push back. Oh, you can't extend life. And then you start blasting them with papers. And then they're basically in a domain that they don't have ready arguments, right? You've, you've pushed them out of, you push them into the ocean. You've pushed them out to sea. You've pushed them into a terrain where they have to come up with something from scratch. They're looking for directions from headquarters. None are coming and they're kind of flailing, right? And sometimes they'll get mad, but sometimes actually they'll convert or they'll, you know, you crash the OS and then they'll come back and think about it. So let me, let me clarify, because it sounds like, um, it, and I don't want to pull you too far out of the abstract, but I, I think it's, it's reasonable for someone with such a varied career and you've worked in all these different places, were the biggest, were the most challenging obstacles that you encountered during sort of the entrepreneurial chapters when you were a founder or co-founder of your own companies? Yeah, because basically, you know, or when you're an executive, when you're CEO, when you are a, a co-founder, like everybody just looks to you for direction. And, you know, it's not so much, I mean, it, it, essentially, you know, Ben has this great post called No One Cares. I, I love this because I sometimes send this to, uh, I actually do care about entrepreneurs, okay? But I, uh, it's, it's, called, it's called Nobody Cares, okay? And yeah, I, I'm just going to give this quote. 
Back in the bad old days when I was running LoudCloud, I thought to myself, how could I have possibly prepared for this? How could I know that half our customers would go out of business? How could I know? Could anybody expect me to achieve a reasonable outcome given those circumstances, right? And then like Al Davis called Parcells, he really has injuries and just replied, Bill, nobody cares, just coach your team, right? That might be the best CEO advice ever because you see, nobody cares. When things go wrong in your company, nobody cares. The press doesn't care. Your investors don't care. Your board doesn't care. Your employees don't care. Even your mama doesn't care. Nobody cares. And they are right not to care. A great reason for failing won't preserve $1 for your investors, won't save one employee's job or get you one new company customer. It especially won't make you feel one bit better when you shut down your company and declare bankruptcy. All the mental energy that you use to elaborate your misery would be far better used trying to find the one seemingly impossible way out of your current mess, right? Now... You know, Zuck also had this, he said this on stage, something like this, like, you know, when you feel boxed in, if you're smart enough, there's usually a move, right? This is like technology is, is multidimensional and there's usually a move. If you're smart enough and you're dedicated enough, you can find it. The The thing that people don't understand, have you ever seen parkour? Do you know what parkour is? Like the, uh, like a, someone doing parkour rather? Mm -hmm. Yes. You, you know how they like scale a wall with no hand handholds it's not meant to be scaled right that is like what doing a startup is like okay you know y combinator has industrialized this and it's good actually that they have made it more accessible and so on and so forth right um but it's still ridiculously difficult maybe yc is like i don't know you have some like gloves on or whatever and maybe there's like a little mat at the bottom so you don't like break your back if you fall or something okay but it's still ridiculously difficult you know and it's it's just like it's something where it can be done today, but it's just very, very, very hard. The, the something to you just have to will it into existence. And um, I mean, one way of looking at that is when you know when you say when it, when, when Ben says nobody cares. I'll just give you a great example. All right. So uh, this is just, again abstract, but uh, uh, journals will complain about oh my god, these CEOs they don't care about work life balance. Blah 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 blah. But then they will, you know, be like, oh, we want a response to this in two hours, our deadlines in two hours, which makes the entire team, you know, they will, they will try to damage your company with negative attacks. They'll do all this type of stuff. Everybody is suddenly woken up and put on a two hour deadline and so on, or uh, the site goes down, everybody's screaming at you online. There's no work-life balance then. You just have to get it done right fucking now, right? And it doesn't matter what else is going on in your life. And the journos don't care. They pretend to care, but they do not care. They will try to jam you into a corner. And not just the journos anymore, but the, the mob on social media, right? Or your customer base, who you do have more of an obligation to, for sure, right? Or your employee base. You know, if, if, if you're not making payroll, God forbid, people don't care why that is the case. They have their own issues. They've got to pay their own rent. They've got to pay this, et cetera. So, like, you know, what that means, what entrepreneurs will often do is they will have to, like, they'll get fat, they'll sacrifice their health, they'll sacrifice their sleep, because they have to sort of borrow against something. And often they'll borrow against physical debt. They'll borrow against this, borrow against that. Um, even That's why, you know, when a, when a company just goes sideways or, or exits, just landing the plane for a company... You know, there's, there's a founder, for example, who I know recently who just sold his company for like 1.5x over after 10 years of slogging it out, literally 10 years. And, you know, I saw that and the first, and, you know, I could tell you somewhat disconsolate in his email. And the first thing I wrote him, I was like, number one, congratulations. Number two, as soon as you're ready, let me know. And, you know, I'll help you with whatever you want to do next. Right. Why? Look, even if it had gone to zero, I would have said that. Right. Uh, okay, there's different ways of going to zero. There's failing in a good way and there's failing in a bad way. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I just say that unreservedly. Okay, failing in a bad way would be like, I don't know, abandoning something and you know, like you know, spending money in Cabo or so. That's very rare actually for like a proper VC backed company, but it, once in a while it happens. That's failing in a bad way, right? Failing in a good way is like giving it your all and then okay, it doesn't work out, right? Fine. That kind of person is actually often, they've got a chip on their shoulder in a good way for the next time. And they've got some wisdom and, you know, like having just gotten beat, they dust themselves off and, and you help them with what they're doing, right? 
And the thing is that, um, I don't know. See, one issue is the statute of limitations on anything. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to say it's ever passed, right? Like, you know, even Ben's thing, you know, he anonymizes lots of case studies and, and so on and so forth. Many of these, you know, business presents difficult situations where you need to achieve the best outcome under the circumstances with nobody helping you, telling you what to do. In fact, you'll often piss off somebody no matter what you do. And now repeat that many times, right? And um, it's it's something where, you know, Ben once said like, you know, being a great CEO is batting, you know, it's, it's like a batter in, in baseball, you know, 30%, 300 average is actually really good, right? So being a great CEO, actually the job is so hard that you'll often fail at many things, actually pretty bad. You might be a C or a D in some areas. You shouldn't be in too many areas, but it's, yeah, it's just, it's just, I don't know. I know I'm speaking very abstractly here, but it's, um, it just, it's just something where you get the gray hairs from, all right, let me give actually a semi-concrete example. Okay. One area where stress comes from in startups is due to small sample size. Whenever you have an interface that has a, you know a small number of employees, a small number of investors, okay, uh, a a small number of customers. If you're an enterprise company, you have only ten customers. One of them goes south, boom, ten percent of your revenue done. That can actually mean your uh, your pitch deck, right? Your revenue that was increasing last quarter, it's suddenly down. You suddenly that's a material update. Every single one of your investors has to get that update. So, you know, right? Oh shit. That means that your round comes apart, right? That means that the thing that you thought was, you know, basically for want of a nail, okay, that customer churns. Why? I don't know. They didn't, somebody didn't get back to them fast enough. They didn't get a bug fast enough. They cancel. When they cancel, and why, why didn't somebody get back to them fast enough? Because you're out raising money, okay? So you're out raising money. They cancel. That reduces your revenue. Now you can't raise money. Now you might not be able to make payroll. You thought it was in the bag. Actually, the investor backs out. They're using this as a thing. Now you are up, you know, shit creek, right? And that's the kind of situation. I mean, that's not a specific one. That specific one is not one I've gone through, but I have seen others go through that, okay? But that gives you a sense of it. When you have small sample sizes, there's serious stress. Another example is you're building some critical product. You've gone and announced it. And the employee or employees that have the key skills quit. They they go and do something else or they're mad or whatever it is, okay? Now you can't build that product that you just announced and took pre-orders for or something like that. There are only three people in the company that had that skill. They're not there, right? Um, or two people or one, whatever, right? Um, what do you do now? Okay, that that's what I mean. Like nobody, so small sample sizes are where stress comes from. And... Uh, when you have a thousand customers by by contrast and one of them leaves, now you don't doesn't matter that much, right? It's it's bad, but like you're not losing sleep over it. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's the small sample sizes that cause stress. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the roller coaster, you know. That's why I, I think it's Andreessen. It's like high highs and low lows and sleep deprivation amplifies all of them. Yes, but but small sample size is where that comes from. If you have a thousand customers and one of them drops, you don't care that much. Even if 50 of them drop. I mean, it's something, it's real. But if you have like five employees and one of them leaves, it's like a huge deal, right? Um, and so that's where the stress comes from, the small sample sizes. The, the closer I have become and the more time I have spent with startup founders and CEOs, the more obvious it is uh, that I think that the compensation that they earn when things, when they are able to will something into existence is absolutely earned and well-deserved. Uh, this is a monumentally difficult achievement. It, it is something where basically it's so difficult to do it that if there wasn't some RO, significant ROI at the end, the, the numbers just don't pencil out, right? You have to have something there. Now, of course, look, do I believe that Employees should have, you know, a, a significant cut. And so I do, right? In fact, you know, one thought, by the way, is like, you could imagine founder liquidation preferences, right? Where it's something where for an employee, 
their first 10,000 or 100,000 in cash or as let alone 1 million is a very significant number for them. But for a second or third time founder, that might not be as much. And so what um, an employee could do is they could trade upside for less downside. Uh, rather than having a, whatever percent of the company, they could get up to, let's say, 100,000 or a million in liquidation preference. And so, so just to, to net out the math, let's say, for example, that in an exit, $200 million is flowing to common, okay, common stock. And you've given a million dollars in liquidation preference to 100 employees, okay, up to a million. Those 100 employees each make a million dollars, and then the founder makes 100 million, okay? Now, by contrast, let's say the exit was now 50 million, right? What would happen is those 100 employees would each get $500,000 and the founder would get zero. That I actually think is, see, something like that is actually a good structure where the founder eats last, but eats best. Do you know what I'm saying? So all your team is fed first. The money is more material to them. But they trade some upside because on their first startup, they don't need to like necessarily, you know, ring the bell all the way to the top, but they want to get to kind of a good number, right? And the second startup, they can be more ambitious. They've got several years of runway. They've got to win under their belt, you know? Um, and so something like that, I think, is the right model. You know, eats best, but eats last. And then you can kind of imagine that working its way down the executive stack, right, where the executives come after the founder and then the you know senior managers and so on, if you could make something like that work. I think with crypto, it might be easier to make stacks like that work. In your own journey, um, I know you have, you've used the term post-economic. And I think that's I was a, not my term. That was actually, uh, was that was that Tim Ferriss' term. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it, wor it worked. Uh, it is the, I, I think that's, it's a very interesting, I mean, we talked about that as leverage and, you know, money just being a tool for whatever comes next. Did that kind of happen for you personally, like slowly? Was it sudden? I've always had a very low, I shouldn't say I always had a very low burn rate. Uh, I, a bit, let's say relative to my means, I've always had a very low burn rate simply because I just don't, you know, I, I don't have expensive tastes. Um, you know, I don't care about fancy, you know, food. I don't care about like expensive holidays. Uh, you know, most of what I do is free in the sense of it's reading, it's writing, it's like recreational math. Books aren't that expensive, you know? And so sort of dispositionally, I have a relatively low personal burn rate or whatever, right? And have for a long time. But, you know, th th there's also kind of being rational relative to your means, right? The thing that I do spend on if I spend on something is productivity. So I will actually, what I spend money on if I spend money on something is time. Um, and so what I mean by that is like, uh, I will spend money to get like a desk assembled. I didn't used to do that, right? Like that's like one kind of thing that I do do with money now that I didn't used to do when I was in my 20s or something. It's just not worth my time to spend an afternoon assembling desks or something, right? If I can outsource that to somebody, they'll do a good job. They'll probably do a better job than I would. The desk won't crash or break or something, right? Um, so, so stuff like that that I used to kind of do myself, I do outsource. But uh, that is, I would not, I don't think of that as actually spending on consumption. I think of that as spending on production because I'm just heads down, like working for those seven or eight or whatever hours that I'm, that I'm saved there. Right. So with respect to like uh, money is interesting because in a sense, this is not completely true and I can give definitely counter examples, but at least one school of thought is the less you need it, the more you can get it. Why? Because for example, um, a founder whose head doesn't really turn at a million dollars or $10 million, you know, they'll only kind of, okay, you got my attention at a hundred million or something is actually somebody who won't sell for like a small amount of money. You know what I'm saying? Zuck famously turned down that billion dollar exit for Facebook very early on, which by the way, was a lot more money back then, right? In the mid two thousands, a billion dollars for Facebook was a lot of money. You know, I don't know the equivalent today, but it'd be like, I'm not, I'm not sure there is. A, uh, now we're used to seeing large exits and, and so on and so forth, right? 
I, I, I have to, you know, I don't know. The equivalent would be something like the second successful startup society decides to turn down an offer for um, some degree of sovereignty in re- because they want to get to like full independence. I don't know. It, it'd be something that's like insanely bold like that, you know, because there weren't lots of precedents before that. Uh, so, so the less they need it, the more, more they can get it. I know, I know I'm not, I'm giving, I'm not giving you very specific answers on this, but yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, uh, what, what did change for you when you became, let's just wealthy. say financially independent? Yeah. Whenever that happened sort of in your career? Well, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. What changed for me? I never bought fancy cars, never bought fancy homes. I never, I never, I don't buy cars or homes. What changed is whenever I could save time with money, I did that. That's the single biggest thing that changed. So I spent the money on being able to work harder. I know it sounds funny, but that's true, right? No, no, I, no. I totally identify with that. Is 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 there anything that um, maybe like a psychologically changed or independent, like um, mm. ideologically changed? I'd say, for I'd say you? look, like as an academic, you know, your bank balance is you, not you give yourself tenure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. So that is actually true. So once I had several years of consumption in the bank, right? Like I knew that if I never worked again, uh, you know, or basically like on my current consumption, I had like 10 years of personal runway, right? Once that first like liquidity event hit and I had like 10 years of personal runway, that's when I became like kind of invincible in a sense. What it did is it made me intellectually independent. You know, it's like getting tenure. And yeah, it was only, it's funny, 10 years is tenure, right? Okay. And in a sense, yeah, it's only 10 years. It's not like 50 years or something. But I knew that over 10 years, once I'd done it once, I knew I could do it again, right? I knew kind of I could calibrate the difficulty and so on. So once you get that first win under your belt, you kind of build the confidence, I think, to be able to do it again and again, right? Or at least it happened for me. Um, and also kind of means that whatever else happened after that point, okay, we've got to win, right? And you know, the thing is that like that now, I mean, with crypto, it's just so, so different. It's so much easier to get like, some liquidity earlier on than it was 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. It's like insanely, insanely different. Um, That's good and bad. It's good because it means there's more younger independent people. It's bad because there's folks who get demotivated when they make money, right? To ask maybe too close to the same question, did you feel more, were you more able to like self-actualize once you became post-economic or were you more um did you just feel like free to speak what was already there yeah not immediately and the reason is because uh for a long time i mean when you're in at any institution you cannot speak as actually when you're ceo of something that i i i would actually say i've only really been able to speak freely to a greater extent over the last year or year and a half okay why is that? Because you had the tech lash during the 20, so the tech lash during the 2010s, I was either turning around companies or I was at highly regulated businesses and so on and so forth. And so it's always constrained in what one can say. And there's certain kinds of things where, you know, the journos basically had a certain uh, thing where they knew that they could mock and jeer and attack executives and founders and VCs, try to humiliate them, try to bankrupt their companies, all this type of stuff. And then the founder of the VC was constrained in terms of punching back in several ways. One is that the journo, if you did resist, would then try to attack you in, you know, get all their friends to write negative articles. Two is LPs would be like, oh my God, I can't believe you're, you know, fighting back. Third is the PR people within many companies or, you know, institutions are actually ex journos typically. And so they are like the enemy within. Okay. They're like the journo sympathizer. And, uh, you know, what they would do is they basically be like, I can't believe you said that to them. Oh my God, but we have to call them right away and apologize. I'm, I, I can't believe. And, and the reason they do that is because, uh, they're within the company, but, their their heart and their soul is with the journos because they think that's actually what being that they think that's what being pure is right like 
being a lower paid journo that's going and you know attacking companies that's actually uh something which shows how good you are because you're investigating things and standing up to power and so on and so forth whereas they've sold out and they feel guilty about that so they will basically be collaborators with the journos right and so all of those things essentially mean that and then finally you know you know folks just don't want um you don't want to take uh you, you have risk you you have risk that you can take right and taking risk on things that are orthogonal to your business is like spending political capital on things that don't matter to your business. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. So if you get into some huge Twitter fight over something that has nothing to do with your business, you're actually, in a sense, making your employees poorer. Right. In fact, it could lead to the loss of your company. They could get attacked. And so on. the way that the stupid social media environment works is people try to impose consequences on your company or whatever for doing something. Right. So. Essentially, it was not simply financial independence. You also need ideological and so also the people around you need to believe the same things, the social supply chain and so on. So it's really post February 2021, I would say, when, you know, essentially the journals basically lost much of their cancellation ability. It had been declining. We put up a huge fight, you know, over 2019, 2020 with their you know, the entire COVID thing and so on. People could see finally they could check what the journalists were saying versus what was true and on a very substantive matter that mattered for a lot of people. Millions of people were dying and the journalists just misreported every aspect of this, both at the beginning and during the lockdowns and all this type of stuff, right? And that plus a bunch of other things kind of penny dropped and you could sort of feel of rotating the gears in a realignment post-February 2021. When, for example, they might have still been able to get Spotify to like pull some stuff from Rogan but it was not a 99-1 victory. It was a 55-45 grinded out victory where, and this was, you know, the crucial difference, you know, the crucial difference between like the Rogan quasi-cancellation and the previous things is that you could defend Rogan on Twitter without getting canceled. Do you see what I'm saying? In previous cancellations, to even speak up in defense of that person, you're outnumbered to such an extent, 99-1, that, you know, you, you, you would just, that would just mean your, your, your graveyard as well as theirs, right? That people were looking for somebody to defend. And so, you know, everyone's kind of just hiding under a rock or whatever, right? By, by mid 2021, but certainly by 2022, now it's like, you know, maybe somebody can grind out a cancellation, but they can't also cancel all their defenders. They simply don't have the troops for it anymore. Okay. That's huge because what it means is they can only pick certain kinds of battles. Their their army is weakened, the establishment forces are weakened, and so on and so forth. And it is social war. That's actually a really good way of thinking about it. And so now you have just less in the way of just really active bandit gangs roaming the newosphere, and you know that plus the financial independence and the time and so on, all of that stuff. The window of opportunity for the network state is out there, right? I might have been able to publish it a year ago, but it's probably after Russia, Ukraine, honestly, I feel that's an important event, you know, and or not, not just after that, but a few months into that, um, especially after May 19th, when Salzberger's guys at the New York Times basically said to Biden to, to quit on Ukraine, right? It was like the Ukraine story is getting complicated or whatever. May 19th, they put that out there. And that kind of showed that even that sort of last gasp, everyone's like, oh yeah, the US is back, the West is back. Actually, it's another Iraq, Syria cluster, right? And so with that, why is that relevant? It's basically the US establishment in general is just losing the ability to just control events domestically and abroad and so on. And so it's not simply about the money, it is about the social network and the receptivity. You can, you can say things and no one will listen and your timing actually has to be good, you know? So all those things kind of have to line up. And I actually feel I've only got, it's funny to say this, but I only feel I've got the, for lack of a better term, the platform and the independence and so on over the last like year and a half or so to really get it out there. And that's what I'm trying to do through this window. The, um, I mean, from, at least from my perspective, uh, it feels like you're having an enormous impact and reach. And I'm, I'm curious what the, like what Balaji Inc. looks like right now? Like what, what, how are you spending time and money to marshal resources in order to affect an impact sort of a, according to your mission? 
Well, it's, it's actually, so first, before I talk about that, I'd really like to hear your perspective on that because it's, it's very useful for me to triangulate and hear from somebody outside the building. Why do you think Biology Inc., so to speak, is having a wide impact or, or enormous impact? Well, I, I emphasize from my perspective because I am in multiple of the bubbles that you would be allowed in, right? I, I read, you know, Shane Parrish and Farnham Street religiously and have for a long time. I follow crypto and have for a long time. I follow startups in VC and have for a long time. So like you are, you have like a presence in almost all of the bubbles that I spend most of my time in. And, but I, what I lack is, you know, if, if you were to survey all of Twitter, like how many people have heard of Bology or the network state? I don't know. Um, and it's getting increasingly hard to like actually assess that. But I, I think the the ideas that you're putting forward are whether or not your name is attached to them i feel like sort of um toppling the mental dominoes uh, at least in the the spheres that uh that i frequent who else do you consider like um see here, the reason is the reason i ask that question is it is hard for me to calibrate because i'm just kind of you know, in my little room, typing on my computer, it's not like there's like, you, you see a number on the screen, oh, you have 670,000 followers or something like that. But it's not, you know, one thing I talk about, have you seen this thing with crowd sizes? Like visualized, crowd sizes visualized? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I often kind of refer to this here. This is a great, great link. Yeah. And if you scroll down, you see like 50 people, 100, right? If you scroll all the way down, right? That is what 180,000 people looks like. Yeah, and that's the biggest or uh, among the biggest stadiums on earth. That's among the biggest stadiums, right? And so, you know, in a sense, when you are, quote, tweeting to like, you know, 670,000 people, that is uh, like, you know, about four of those. So it's like, it's like basically, uh, you know, going up to like seeing the star spangled banner or whatever in the center of that, you know what I'm saying? Right. And yet it doesn't feel like that until this is one of the things I'm, I'm, you know, experimenting with and I want to build, I want to build a VR version of Twitter where the peripheral vision is crucial to the whole experience. I think if you don't just, uh, cause those, those 600, whatever something followers are not all synchronously there at the same time. If they were, and if they could see each other and everybody knew that all these other people were real and verified, that would be a completely different thing, right? Like the sense of peripheral vision is a huge part of just like, it clicks for humans. It's like the difference between um, Facebook versus sixdegrees.net. It, it was a text-based social network in the late 90s. It was before there were enough digital cameras and high bandwidth connections to allow photos online, Okay. Facebook was able to get going in 2004 at Harvard and at colleges because they had fast connections and there were enough well-heeled college students that they could take digital camera photos and people had like one or two JPEGs of themselves in like the early 2000s. It's like this whole moment of like having lots of photos and videos or things actually pretty, pretty recent, right? iPhone wasn't there, all that stuff, right? So you had to go and get a digital camera, you had to scan it, whatever. That was like a pain in the ass. So people didn't do it that much. Point being that... Um, that jump from text to a 2D thing with pictures was a huge jump in terms of immersiveness. And I think the next step from 2D to 3D will be another huge jump. The reason I bring all this up is, on the one hand, I have this like Texas Motor Speedway times four or whatever audience right now. On the other hand, I built it from tweeting in my pajamas or on the treadmill, right? So it's, it's like a very, it's a surreal kind of experience, you know? where um, it's not like there's a roaring crowd around here. You don't necessarily get feedback in the same way. You get it on screen, which is a little different, but it's like a video game. And it just feels very different when you see somebody in person who has read the tweet and you're like, oh, like this finance minister of Finland is reading it. Oh, that's kind of surprising. You know, you don't, you don't really have a sense of where it's ricocheting or who's reading it or who's paying attention. You're like, uh... You know, you're putting it, it's almost like a, like a video game. It doesn't feel real, 
Plus, I'm also used to arguing, like I'm, I come into every kind of discussion with the assumption that I need to justify everything from scratch. I take nothing for granted. I mean, you, you probably know that from like how I engage in debates or, it's, you know, it's like- It's even from like, how right? you engage in friendly conversation. You just like, well, let me start from first principles in case you question anything I'm about to say. So- <laughs> Yes, that's right. That's right. And Which is, and, which is um, yeah, sometimes makes it hard to end up, you know, at the- there's yeah, you're hey, rebuilding so much. I, I I won't be. I can be concise, but if I'm concise, I feel I I can be very concise. Sometimes, and I actually I think I am on yeah. Twitter. Go ahead. It feels risky to be concise in, in some environments. That's right. I'm used to having people quibble with every statement and word. So I'm like, boom, boom, boom. Let me establish the pillars, build a base camp. You know what the Chinese call the mountain of iron, like. Before the U.S. goes and invades Iraq or something like that, it builds a mountain of iron outside the border, all these tanks and planes and so on, before it actually launches the invasion, okay? So before I launch my argument, it's the mountain of iron of all of this supporting infantry and whatever that's all lined up, right? You know, it's just like the other day, Justin Amash, you know, just literally yesterday, I had a great podcast with him, and we were just talking about, like, you know, he was like, well, have, have, haven't things gotten better in the last 50 years? And I was like, well... Here are 10 graphs just to anchor it, you know, aviation, like this, that, blah, 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 blah. And then I realized, you know, I mean, I know this, but I'm not, like, that's not normal <laughs> to be, right? It's because basically I've wanted to, because otherwise it's like, oh, here's my opinion. Here's my opinion. And it's like, okay, here's like 10, to my knowledge, at least quantitative facts that anchor the discussion. And what that sort of does is it kind of, I think it, it puts the ball on the 85 or the 90 yard line. It doesn't mean you're just, it doesn't mean you can just run into the end zone, but at least what it does is like, okay, I've thought about this a bit. Right. Um, and I guess the reason, the reason I do that is if you're going to make a concise statement that actually has information, it's going to be provocative in some way. And then it's going to invite pushback and you preempt the pushback by building that mountain of iron. But anyway, coming back up. So because I need to argue from every, feel that I need to argue everything from scratch, because I, you know, engage with the journos that make me have to do that. And with all of these, you know, mo mo fo followers, more money, more problems, like, you know, you'll have folks who try to distort or take it out of context and so on. And so you just have to have the verbal weaponry at hand, you know, to be like tick, 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 like this. With folks who want to distort, who want to attack, and so on. so I'm always prepared for that, and that's why, like when you're very focused on all the folks who uh, disagree or who attack or who you have to convince from scratch or on the boundary, you know, and so on, it can be sort of easy to forget all the folks who like what you're doing. One way of, of looking at that is just the, the way social media works, if you agree with something, you hit like. If you disagree, you reply. Yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's almost like a, a customer. It's like you're, uh, you're going after converting the most hostile customers and addressing the people complaining instead of, you know, investing in the happy customers and getting them to refer their friends, right? That's right. And so the thing is that because this group of folks who likes and agrees is spread out, right? Like, you know, for example, I was I was a little surprised that someone was like, uh, I haven't been in SF for a while, but someone's like, oh, you know, Balji, you're probably one of the most mentioned people at like SF parties or something like that. Like, oh, you know, do you see Balji's tweet or something like that, right? I was like, I, I don't know if, if that fits your, you know, your, your experience. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Well, okay, that's cool. But it, it, the reason is that a lot of that has kind of, ha it's a lot of it is end loaded. Do you know what I mean? You have an exponential or whatever, and most of it has come in the last one or two or three years because you're on this upward thing, right? And in the event that the network state gets where it's going to get, I'm still at the base of the exponential, right? Like easily there's another 10x or 100x in front of this. If this if this concept gets out there and really does what it can yeah. do, go ahead. Uh, well, that's, I mean, that's the... Uh... I guess that's what I'm driving at is how, what does the work look like today and how do you continue to invest in, in that vision or in that 
in progress in that yeah, direction. Yeah, so bo- what does Bology Inc. look like? It is, it's essentially something where I have a very small group of folks who are highly aligned and, um, you know, they help with, for example, like the networkstate.com website or, uh, you know, other things we haven't announced yet, like the dashboard, which we did announce. Um, it's a very small group of Navy SEALs who are all folks I think of as basically like, you know, probably future startup founders or early people, you know, maybe startup society founders. And they're all like basically protégés. What I prefer is like an Instagram, like tiny, tiny team, very small team of just folks who are athletes, right? They're smart. They work hard. They work well together. There's no, there's no politics because basically everybody's sort of selected for alignment, right? Um, And, uh, you know, they know that to the best of my ability, I will take care of them in their career and help them level up and try to have that discussion with them. Like what would be a success for you in like a month or three months or six months or a year, you know, try to make it a positive, some interaction, recognizing, of course, you know, sometimes this doesn't work and sometimes this doesn't work, but overall trying to, you know, deliver the best I can for them. And, uh, that's, that's Bology Inc. Basically is like a small group of highly aligned people like a Instagram ish type of group if we're successful oriented around the mission. Like is the whole mission of that, the network state. Uh, now it is. Yes. So now basically the mission is build the first network state build building it, not just popularizing the concept, but also starting one yourselves. Well, well, or let's call it catalyzing it or, you know, what I'd like to achieve in 10 years is not a million copies of the book sold, but the first network state, recognized. Mm-hmm. And do you, um, are you expecting or intending or even hoping that you will also be the founder of that network state that gets created? Like, are you trying to also start your own or are you just trying to encourage other people to start theirs? Yeah. So, um, I actually think that, uh, part of, I, I thought about this a lot and I actually think that the decentralization is a very important, um, piece of it. And in this case, the decentralization comes from a bunch of people doing it. And in fact, it's almost better if like, um, you know, as an analogy, I'd be the Paul Graham and I would find the Patrick Collison. Right. Why is that better? Because, you know, a relay race, like in the Olympics, like, you know, guys got a baton, right? So if we take, for example, Coinbase and Zcash, right? Coinbase could not have done Zcash internally. It would have been too much regulatory risk, too many things piled into the same vehicle. And conversely, Zcash Zcash could not have done Coinbase, right? Having them, however, split out and separated meant that the ecosystem as a whole could move forward, right? Right? There's like a value to the decentralization where there's a vector sum, you know, even if this and this, right? But they're both got a point that that sums in this direction, right? And so the value of having a hundred, a thousand different network states and me being a catalyst for it and doing what I, you know, look, can I execute in the physical world? I can. I've done robotic build outs and stuff like that. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at that. But I think I'm really good. Like my, my, comparative advantage is probably going to be on the writing and the funding and the content, right? Basically the media and the money. Um, that's where I, I, I think, I, you know, uh, relatively better than even the physical build out. And there's folks who are good at the physical build out, but they aren't good at, or not as good, whatever, in terms of comparative advantage at some of the things I am and vice versa, right? So, so that's how I sort of think about it is a, it's got the decentralization, B, it kind of optimizing my skill sets. And so essentially putting out the plans and then, you know, another way of putting it is the idea guy is worth something, not maybe not that much, but the idea plus capital guy is worth quite a bit. Right. And so then that's a good deal where you have the idea plus capital guy and I'm catalyzing things and helping things along. And I've got a hundred, a thousand startup societies around the world. And I'm just like, like this, you know, and I can just go tuk, 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 like this, right? Go ahead. Yeah. And, and you can focus attention on those that need it and sort of channel information or talent or additional money. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I can u- unionize them and I can like basically have them 
that grouping and that kind of articulation of a moral code, like that is a whole full, I mean, like Y Combinator is a whole thing in its own right. It's like a serious project in its own right, right? And uh, the reason I just cite that is that's like maybe the closest parallel, though, you know, this is not a startup company incubator. Um, it is it is quite different, right? Uh, obviously, it's, you know, crypto, it's Web3, it's, it's much more political in certain ways, much more international from the beginning. All those kinds of things are different. But it is startup societies, right? And so, you know, a thousand presidents of startup societies is our united networks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I like that. Um, so do you want to, let's uh, dive into investing a little bit here. Um, cause that, that is something I remember, uh, in our last session, you talked about being surprised to find that you were good at and a, a lily pad that you landed on and are still sort of, um, carrying forward, which is very, very exciting. How, how do you like, so let's like talk through a little bit of, you know, your process, your criteria, um, and how you get up to speed on, you know, new, new technologies, new industries, um, the kind of things that, uh, get you excited. So there's sort of different kinds of investors, obviously, you know, um, I'd say that, you know, really I have the DNA of a seed investor, um, because I'm like an academic who's good at finding good students. I'm, I'm a ex executive or founder that is good at finding good engineers, like, you know, like smart, talented people. And I'm good at identifying, I think, really smart founding CEOs and, and so on. And not just smart, creative, you know, all that type of stuff, whatever, right? Those folks, you know, like, I think I'm, I'm decent at that. Um, what I'm not as good at are like, or I can do it, but, you know, there's, there's other kinds of investors, for example, those who are doing growth rounds, right? Like C or D rounds, or those who are doing public markets investing. And there it starts to become much more about very specific details of price and you know you have to be like you know you can make money by investing at 400 mil but not at 500 mil or you have to time the exit at a very certain time and there's folks who love that type of stuff and are good at that kind of stuff and i can be good at it right but i don't like it you know, it's like, it's just something where you just have to pay way more attention. It, it, if you're directionally right on an investment and then, you know, okay, maybe you get 8X rather than 10X at the top, but you're directionally right. And you can be directionally right on a lot of things. And, uh, you know, let's say you're right on 70 out of 100 bets. That's an amazing portfolio. That's like kind of my portfolio. Yeah, 70, 80 out of 100 bets, I'm, I'm, I'm usually up, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what our empirical portfolio is. I think out of something like uh, a few hundred investments, 85% have had like up rounds or something like that, right? Which is a pretty good slugging percentage. And, you know, we'll see where that is, but that's like, you know, a few years in or whatever, right? What's really hard is to figure out what the right price to exit is for each of those things. And there's other folks who love doing that, and I don't like that. That's also the same reason like DeFi. I, DeFi is great as a tool. I, I'm, I'm glad it exists. I think it's cool intellectually, the composability, you know, curve and Uniswap and so on. But I'm, I've never been a big DeFi guy for lots of reasons because it's just like, you know, I, I never got involved, by the way, in any of these stablecoin or interest things and so on. And the reason being, or as a century, I, I, I helped launch USDC. What I mean is like putting money into yield farming and arbitrage and so on. Someone like Sam Bankman-Fried like loves that stuff, is geared for that, right? He's an arbitrager. He's very good at what he does. And, you know, I respect what he does and, and, and so on. And, and he also, his meaning comes outside of that in, in like effective altruism or what have you, right? This is just kind of like a video game and you get the points and then you do something else with it, right? It's kind of, right? The, th the thing is that that kind of, uh, that kind of arbitrage uh, you know, if you are putting money into a DeFi protocol that's getting you back five or 10 or whatever percent interest, right? Um, you're probably taking principal risk and not bank account risk, right? So if you're taking principal risk, then actually 10 or 15, meaning you could lose the whole thing, which people did do in you know, all these various CFI, DeFi blow ups. And when that's happening, like you're like, 
if I'm taking principal risk, I just prefer to be in a seed investment where I can get 10x. I don't want to take, you know, the the dumb thing to do is to put in a million, be like, yay, I'm getting like 10% a year or something like that, or even 10%. I mean, 10% a month is a lot on a million, but let's say you're, you know, and then but the issue is that you have a significant chance of losing the entire million. So your downside risk is much higher than you think. And it's not being stated properly because it's in smart contract compromises or some Ponzi thing or whatever that's happening. So for all those kinds of reasons, you you have to just pay close attention and you need to spend your mental energy on it to a much greater extent than people think when you're babysitting a later stage investment. Like you're watching the numbers every single day for one moment where you just boom, hit the button and go, right? Maybe you can automate this, but even then, you can just give you a like a, for a large amount of money. You're not going to fully automate. You're going to wait and then confirm. So you have to be like awake. Oh, time to sell is two forty one a.m. Get up, boom, hit the button, <gasps> boom, like this, right? But that's a terrible way to live, you know. <laughs> and so, the kind of investing that I like is the find the smart person, mentor them, level them up, and so on and so forth. And it's rewarding because it's also participating in a zero to one moment, hopefully, of something that you believe in and that's cool and that the world needs. So I've got, I've got a question from somebody who sort of read the manuscript early here that I think is like, you'll probably personally have an interesting answer um, and maybe one that's generalizable. But from basically your whole 20s, you were in school at Stanford, getting collecting various degrees. And you've talked about sort of whether you the, the payoff of each one, but then you went and started a company after that. So I'm just curious how you think about the sort of the trade-off um, between focusing really hard on learning, um, whether that's in academia or not, versus when to start applying, whether that's starting a company or publishing or writing or whatever that is. So the, the learning versus doing balance um, in, in career cycles. So, uh, so I didn't spend my entire twenties in school, just like the first half of it. Um, and I, so I got my PhD, uh, just before I turned, uh, 26. So, um, and I started teaching at Stanford after that. And that's a young, so yeah, that's so a young like, PhD. It's fairly young. I mean, I, I did still waste a lot of time, um, and I wouldn't advise doing the PhD anymore to anybody. I wouldn't even advise myself to have done it then. I just didn't have. Uh, I was just a few years too young. Uh, I was right in that window where the dot-com boom wasn't happening when I graduated and open source hadn't really gotten out there. So it's just in that window where it kind of didn't make sense to start something right then. Um, but uh, so repeat your question though. You said something about academic it, students. Sort of the, I, will, I will do a much simpler version. Um, how do you personally balance focusing on learning versus focusing on applying in the market? Like wh when do you stop studying and start uh, doing oh, learning versus applying? I, I actually kind of think you nowadays, I sort of feel you almost, you have to try to apply to learn and, and back, right? Like in the, in the network state book, one thing you might notice is like a lot of the history and philosophy stuff there on like the definition of a nation and so on is actually used in a very applied way, right? It's literally for the prospective founder of a startup society uh, in the same way that you might read like various, you know, VCs or angels telling you, okay, go remote this, set up your compensation like that. You're reading like Renan and Rousseau and so on, on like, what is a nation, right? And that actually becomes like ridiculously applied because you're, you're, you know, you know, who else thought like that were the founding fathers, right? All of that philosophy, all that history was actually of the many different, the hundreds of millions of humans who had lived before them. They had one life, but there were hundreds of millions of humans who had lived before. All those reps went into their design of, you know, this legal system, right? And they knew, wh why did they have something like the First Amendment, right? Because they had seen previous regimes that had restricted it. That's, that's the, dis it's not quite the same as like Newton's first law or whatever, but it's something where they'd observed all these things in history. We're like, we want to, we've seen this, uh, this uh, failure mode happen many times. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen again. I do think that like uh, the application helps you learn. And it's actually really hard to learn without an application. Absolutely. Okay. So last session, we talked a little bit about, so we started early career sort of academia and then through entrepreneurship and now into, I guess, what we're going to call like the independence chapter. 
Um, and I think that that transition into the independence is, is a really interesting one, especially since the previous two you sort of had models for, you know, Feynman, Ramanujan, Gates, Jobs. Did Was there something that you saw or someone that you saw sort of on this frontier that you were like, oh, cool, like this is a this is a path Did it just sort of appear naturally in your in your career? Um, what of being a tech founder? Uh, no, of of like the last two years of basically like s- serving an ideology, uh, oh. I guess. Um, oh, sure. So I think I think Theodor Herzl is certainly you know a model figure there, where he is the one who wrote the book that led to the forming of Israel. Okay, so um, he he wrote a book called Der Judenstaat, the Jewish State, where he said, "Look, here's all these problems in the world." You know, he basically was pointing out that, you know, at the time, the Jewish community was persecuted within countries and they had various kinds of options like, was, was it to be revolution? Was it to be assimilation? Was it to be this or that, right? There's all these different solutions or whatever proposed within the community. And uh, what he said was, we need to go from just being a stateless nation to a nation that has a state, Right. Rather than being a nomadic people fully, we need a home base, we need a territory we can call our own. And of course, that gained much more relevance, uh, or not relevance, that's not, that's not the right term. Like, it became obviously the right decision for many people after the Holocaust and after World War II and so on and so forth. But at the beginning, it was not an obvious thing. And he was actually like mocked for it. But he persisted with, you know, he had uh, uh, the World Zionist Congress and he had funding and he gathered people from around the world. And, um, you know, it, it, like obviously there were a lot of other people that that contributed to the founding of Israel, but he was, he's, you know, a very important person in the sense of the, basically the father of modern Israel. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, obviously there's things where you want to, um, you know, Israel is one inspiration. Uh, America is another inspiration. There's two more, you know, India contributes the concept of nonviolent independence and uh, Singapore contributes the concept of the um, the city state run by a founder. Right. And so you kind of put those together and you have like America's constitution, Israel's like sort of founding book and like religious zeal, India's nonviolent independence, Singapore's city state run by, you know, this amazing founder CEO. Now you start to see how the network state pulls threads from all of those together and knits it, right? And all of those, of course, are like a fork. Each of those, America, India, Israel, and Singapore are all forks of like British common law. You know, you can trace it back because they were all former British colonies, you know? You know, you can, there's other bits and pieces from other different cultures and stuff. Those those four, I think of as things that one can learn from in architecting new startup societies. Like you can take essentially those four pieces, right? You have the Lee Kuan Yew style founder who writes the Herzl style one commandment book, has a American constitution style crypto protocol and has the India style nonviolent independence, right? And you combine those and you've got something like pretty darn interesting. All right, all of, all four of those are important pieces, and of course, that's reductive. I'm 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 taking this very complicated thing and I'm reducing it just a few words because you know that's a compact way. You can you can take more pieces of each of these independence movements and so on. There's details on them that are that are helpful, but but overall, you're taking uh, and, and all those countries. By the way, they're not they're not well. America might be. I was going to say they're not in civil war. You know, they're not <laughs> right, but um, they are now all reasonably successful countries, right? Like they've all had significant successes. It's not like some war-torn, yeah, you let's know, not country, pick on anybody. right? Yeah. <laughs> let's not pick on anybody. Exactly. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. So I want to, I want to enter the, sort of the uh, domain of the ideas. And I'm excited about this because uh, well, this is what really what the meat of the book is about. I'm curious about your perspective uh, here. So I want to like, uh, before I show you my cards a little bit, I want to kind of hear what you think I have. 
so knowing that I've basically spent almost the last two years sort of consuming everything that you have created and trying to distill it into what is explicitly the most universally appealing, valuable, sort of um, evergreen, life-changing ideas for somewhat of an average reader and presenting them sort of as succinctly but as completely as possible in in one sort of tight session. I don't know if you actually would I would have picked the same ideas that I do. Um, and so I'm curious what you think, like what you think those ideas would be. And then I'll kind of show you like where I'm at and what I'd, what I'd like to sort of flesh out. Well, so first of all, you know, like, uh, one thing I want you to know is you've got a line to me now. So if you, um, if you want feedback or something like that, like, uh, I, you know, that, that's one way in some ways I'm quite similar to my friend of all, but in other ways I'm different and like, I'm much more, whatever, hands on, I, I, I'm a quantity time person in some ways. Right. And, you know, he's, he's some, he's sort of better about time boxing things sort of, but I'm, that's not my thing to your question. Like, how do I think about it? I mean, if you're sort of distill kind of how I think about the world, it's how to level up as an individual and then as a group and then as like for humanity as a whole. Right. And so that's like, you know, in the magic, the gathering color wheel in this context, the blue black of like leveling up knowledge and leveling up, um, you know, money is important as a tool for knowledge, for being able to build things, to fund things and so on and so forth. That, you know, that, that kind of remark he had in there where like transhumanism is a very blue black, you know, kind of ideology, right? Uh, as opposed to, let's say the EPA, it's very white green. It's using the law to like regulate things in the name of the environment, but to stasis and, you know, you know, stopping change. Right. So a lot of what I do appeals to people who are on that blue black wavelength, right? Especially blue, the bluer of the blue black, right? I think, you know, if you are, if you're black blue, you would prefer Naval's writing over mine. And if you're blue black, you prefer mine over Naval's. And if you're almost exactly the same, you, you kind of, right? Because um, Naval's work is great. Um, but like, you know, he has, you know, that thread that everybody liked, which is like how to get rich without getting lucky. Right. What was really interesting to me about that thread is I thought everything on there was super obvious, really, really, really obvious. But I, I realized that that had not been articulated. And I also realized that actually he had put a genius thing into the title of it because so many people think that getting rich is about getting lucky. And they don't think it's, it's a reproducible process or what have you. And even the term rich is like, it's something of a, you know, it's a weird term in, in American, you know, life, whereas it doesn't like a, a more, a better term would be like successful or productive, you know, um, which doesn't have any negative connotation, right? Rich can have a negative connotation because you can be born rich as opposed to built rich, right? Or you can be, uh, you know, uh, un, undeservedly rich. Anyway, so it is how to level up as an individual, as a group, and as like, you know, human society. I think that's like one way that you can encompass a very large body of how I think about things with the blue of the blue black being the more important of the two. If you notice, I, it's not that I don't talk about commercial stuff. In fact, crypto is money, but it's very rare that I talk about price and their stuff. Just, you know, like I'm not saying never, ever. Sometimes like if someone's arguing with me, I'll point to a price as a way of showing that there actually is traction, but it's just not where my natural wavelength is, mm -hmm. you know? All right, let me pause there. Yeah. All right. So let me let me ask this just very brief question. What what are the mental models or heuristics that you use the most often? So there's a few things I do. In math, for example, I've come up with this heuristic, which is that uh you want to understand things algebraically, verbally, visually, numerically, algorithmically. Okay. Example, let's take the concept of an eigenvalue, right? AX equals lambda X, algebraic, algebraic definition. Verbally, okay, these are the solutions of a characteristic equation. It's a way of representing like a linear transformations action on a vector, right? 
visually, you can actually show eigenvectors and eigenvalues of um, of, a, of a matrix. And uh, numerically, you can hand calculate them by solving the characters equation, forming the determinant, solving the characters equation. And then algorithmically, you can write code to take, you know, for example, for a two by two matrix, take the A, B, C, and D and spit out the eigenvalues. Okay. Now, if you can do all five of those and just like rattle it off, then you usually like understand a concept because you've seen it from a few different angles. And, you know, that's when I sort of, if I poke somebody on something, right? Uh, for example, let's say a uh, net present value. So that's a great example of something where you can understand it um, algebraically, verbally, visually, numerically, algorithmically, right? There's, there, uh, there's a tweet you have, I, I think it's a tweet where you also include, uh, you include computation or computational and algorithmic are probably the same. You include a six, which is, yes, computational algorithmic are the same. Which, which is historic, okay. which I think is another really interesting one. Like how was it derived? Where did it come from? When was it discovered? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So sometimes the historical can be very helpful. That's right. Um, but I would consider that one optional because you don't need to like in terms of like need to know you don't need to know where eigenvalues came from necessarily because it's so like conditional on knowing the equations you don't need to know who invented them though it can help for color right but that's one important so so applying that to math but you can apply that to other things right i will try to take something and restate the verbal as a sketch or restate the sketch as numbers of some kind, right? And often I can see things that way that I couldn't, like doing those transformations uh, it can help, right? For example, let's say you've got a bunch of complicated deals, okay? Different contracts with different parties. Putting them all on the whiteboard and saying, we owe this to this guy at this time, and here's the cash flow payment, and this to this guy at this time, and here's those cash flows, and we want to get this to this guy over here, you can now start seeing manipulations that you wouldn't be able to do with the contracts as a whole, okay? Another version of this is uh, in the bylaws and charter of a company, okay? It will have various thresholds. It's like, you need all of common stock to be able to vote for uh, like a new board member or like common stock and a and B to all vote for, you know, the issuance of more shares for C and, and so on and so forth, right? There's, very, there's, there's a permissions matrix, okay? For various actions down the side, you need various quora along the top, like sort of like the House and the Senate have to both vote together. It has to pass like 60% of the Senate and half the House, just like that, right? But it's like common A and B if you've got multiple rounds in a company, okay? That permission matrix is actually the distillation of lots and lots of words. And you look at that permission matrix and you're like, okay. And then you've also got a second matrix, which is the cap table. And it's got all of the investors that constitute and all the shareholders that constitute the common, the A and the B. And then what you've also got is sort of their individual social relationships to you. And you're like, okay, this guy's in a good mood. This guy's in a good mood. This guy, okay, this guy's mad for something else. I can get them in a good mood by helping them on this axis. Then I've got the quorum that helps me get this permission. And you're essentially doing a combined like algebraic and social problem here. But you can, if you've got the matrices on screen, you can start computing it, right? So it's like a combination of like the house majority whip to try and figure out the social status of, you know, you know what I'm saying, right? With matrix algebra over here, because you're trying to figure out how do I get a path through this complicated set of permissions to get, turn, turn the key in the lock, right? And sometimes that's something where it's like, Okay, we'll take these three people first because the fifth guy will, or the fourth and the fifth will do something that the first three people have already signed off. So we spend all our energy convincing them first, and then we go to these other folks, right? So similarly with slides, and actually, this is actually, you know, it's funny, is this why I think the network state like is a V1? I keep saying V1, V1, because it, you know, there's one aspect of it that is completely different from the way that I normally do long things. And that is, it is extremely verbal. It's not as visual as most of my content, much of my content is, right? Why is that? Well, um, a lot of my slide decks, I'm able to use content from online to just quickly illustrate something, right? Now, uh, you know, the thing is that when you've got a book on Kindle, like there's all these IP rights and stuff like that. So every figure has to be made from scratch. And it was kind of like, it's... It, 
you know, like I, I, we made a few figures, right? But what I, one of the things I'm doing is I'm going to do another pass, write a lot of content, clean up everything, and then generate a bunch of new figures in like a very consistent form that are meant for like mobile rendering and, and, and so on and so forth, right? And uh, I'm actually kind of excited about that because then I can basically like tweet out the whole book in like 200 figures. Returning to the, like my, my distillation of your ideas, which I, I th am I'm curious for your reaction on, but I think the big themes that arose to me, again, with the filter being truly evergreen and generally universal are the massive importance of technology secondarily the sort of the art and the discipline of seeking truth and the different types of truth that exist and then applying both of those to really be extremely high agency in the creation of a better future probably mostly through company building but obviously now also with some alternative paths as well control using technology to be high agency is definitely something I believe in, um, in, in the sense of, uh, you know, of course you would do that, right? Like that's a lever out there and you're trying to move something. So that lever's on the ground. Why would you not use that? Right. However, what I actually often find is that people don't want to do that. They want to do things the way that it's always been done. Right. Why? Because learning how to use that lever is a new thing. And what happens if the lever breaks, huh? You know, right? And there's risk in using the lever. Why don't we just shove it with our bodies like we've always done? The FDA right? won't let you use so, the lever. It might hurt you. Yeah, the regulation. FDA won't let you use the lever. Exactly, right? So, um, so that's something like that I think of as ridiculously, obviously good that is actually still much more of a struggle than, than you might think. And then what happens is when you win that struggle... Uh, you you better win money. And the reason you need to win money is because the people who are wrong, either A, they don't admit they're wrong, or B, they do, and then they're like, who could have known, right? So they attack the thing the whole way. They gain status. Ha ha, this will never work, blah, blah, blah. They attack and harass. And at the end, they're like, well, I admitted I was wrong. What more do you want, Right. And it's like, you you tried to literally, you know, stop this whole thing from happening. And now you say you admit you're wrong. They'll never like, you know, the status gain that you get cannot, is not enough to compensate for all those attacks that are happening. So you need to actually post huge money gains so that you just outcompete the people who are wrong to such an extent. And what we haven't done, and now what tech needs to do is turn those money gains into massive status gains, Right such that like haters are actually disincentivized status-wise. I mean, it took me a long time to understand that the journos who are so wrong about everything, and I mean like, uh, for, I mean, we're not talking off by like 50% or something like that. We're talking like off by millions of fold on Bitcoin, on COVID, on like, you know, the number of people dead in Iraq, like every single thing, it's like, you know, inflation, blah, blah, like they're, they're off by orders of magnitude on everything. And they're still around, you know, they're not fired or anything like, and the reason is they're optimizing for power rather than money. They are optimizing for the establishment to have a narrative to smash its enemies. And that's what they're paid for. Uh, they, they are paid to essentially repeat something at a given time. It's the school of fish strategy where they all say the same thing at the same time. And then, you know, they all attack you at the same time as an individual. And then if uh, one of them is wrong, they're all wrong together. And so none of them will, you know, go and cast the other guy out. The, they're, the, 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 both the attack and the defense are the same thing, which is everyone was saying it's how can you single me out, right? But they'll single you out when you're saying something different, right? As such, that's actually why I started to realize that the money was ridiculously important because it's only marker, it's the only thing that makes the natural selection of correct ideas work. It doesn't always work, but it's like the one thing that you've got because they're not gonna give you, they're not gonna say, I was completely wrong, I'm resigning from everything, I will shut up and commit digital harikari after that. I'm so sorry that I tried to interfere with the Moderna vaccine. I'm so sorry that I tried to say that the internet wasn't gonna work. Like, you know, a great example of this is, just to give you a concrete example, this guy, like, um, IT doesn't matter. Okay. 
this guy wasn't a pain in the ass for me, but he was for like uh, Mark and 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 Ben at one point, right? So he had this stupid uh, thing. Okay, this was in two thousand three. IT doesn't matter. Why? Because everybody's using computers, dude. So it's all baked in. There's no advantage anymore, right? 2003, he's saying this, okay? Before Uber goes and disrupts taxis, before Airbnb disrupts this, before Facebook, you know, like he's basically saying it's all priced in, dude. It's all done. You're just not going to be any advantage anymore, right? Of course, this was ridiculously and wildly wrong, right? Just because computers were everywhere didn't mean that like, you know, like even by the way, the term, if you call it IT, then it's like a bolt on to a company. Whereas if you call it computer science and engineering, it's like the core thing. And the CEO understands it as opposed to being like the, the help desk, right? Nothing wrong with the help desk. Don't get me wrong, but it's the difference between an electrician and an electrical engineer, you know? And, uh, so this is just a good example. There's so many more, you know, like this, like, uh, yeah, I always thought it'd be funny. Who was the, the guy who like in the early nineties, like the, inter the internet's a fad was like a famous line by, yeah, uh, the, know, it wasn't Thomas Friedman, but it was the, somebody, um, the, uh, Paul Krugman. So Paul many, Krugman. like uh, the, and, why the internet will fail, the Clifford stole one. Yeah. I, I really like the idea of yeah. like Paul Krugman not being allowed to use the internet because he was, a, you know, scoffed at it in the early nineties. Uh, so, so the thing is that basically you do need something like this which is to say, uh, you know, NFTs or something along those lines that give some degree of accountability. Like, I mean, money is, is good. It's better than nothing. Okay. Those people who are right when they were a thousand X writer than somebody else, you're not going to have the guy who is wrong say a thousand times that they were wrong. I'm so sorry. I tried to character assassinate you. Uh, you, you know, a great example of this is January 13th, 1920, the New York Times published an editorial insisting that a rocket couldn't possibly work in space. That Professor Goddard, with his, quote, chair in Clark College and the countenancing of the Smithsonian Institution, from which Goddard held a grant to research rocket flight, does not know the relation of action to reaction of the need to have something better than a vacuum against which to react. To say that would be absurd. Of course, he seems only to lack the knowledge ladled out daily in high schools, right? But he pushed back against the wave of criticism in a Scientific American article but Noonster's law doesn't apply to PR, and his response was mostly drowned out by the attacks. He retreated from the public eye and from most interactions with other scientists, but continued his research. Eventually, of course, he'd be vindicated, but it took until July 17, 1969, more than almost 50 years later, for the New York Times to take back its harsh words. The 1969 correction is almost comically dry and conspicuously doesn't mention the Apollo missions. The Times regrets the era, right? So after, like, I mean, by the way, this setback humanity how long right the mars you know mars mission or the, you know like the apollo might have happened like decades earlier or whatever right so these like criminals basically you know they, by the way no, even then they're going after his grant funding do you see that they're like why the smithsonian institute fund this guy you know so like these guys have been the, the journo versus tech thing has been going on for so long okay it, you know, Matt Ridley writes about this in his book on innovation. Ida Tarbell and all these creatures went after uh, Rockefeller and others. All the captains of industry who built America were all torn down by these journos in the early 1900s. And now we're actually fighting that same battle in reverse. And I think this time the tech founders are going to win. Right. Like, you know, my thing about history is going in uh, the opposite direction. Right. So why did I, why did I get on that? It's because... Um, that's where the, uh, I, I was talking about the money component, but why, why, uh, remind well, me where we were. I, 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 I think the money, the money is also interesting because it it is what allows us to compound and reinvest in the next round of technologies. Um, so, well, I want, and, and that's really where I want to focus at the moment, actually. So it is clear that technology is massively, massively important and kind of fundamental to your ideology something that I had not found anywhere in your work that I'm curious uh, or would like to explore is your definition of technology. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. Um, Teal also talks about politics and technology. And um, the other thing that actually he doesn't, he talks about, but separately from that, he'll, he'll talk about politics versus technology. The other thing he talks about separately from that is faith, right? Um, he's like a Christian and so on and so forth. And those actually map to my sort of, uh, 
you know, trinity of God, state, and network, right? Faith, politics, technology. You know, faith is God, politics is the state, and technology is the network. Okay. And very, 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 very roughly, faith is the appeal to God or the church or a religion or a religious community or something along those lines, moral uh, premises, et cetera. Politics is the appeal to or use of the state. And that's the law that is uh, the military that is, um, you know, bans and mandates and, you know, bills and rules and regulations and so on. And technology is the network. And today, of course, that's the internet and that's a cryptocurrency network. So is it, I found this amazing uh, book called Force and Freedom. So this is from like the 1800s, right? This book in, you know, like 200 years ago called Force and Freedom. And state, religion, and culture, religion is God, state is a state, and culture is the network. So way before the internet, Burkhart, this philosopher, look at how he defines culture. All that has spontaneously arisen, all social intercourse technologies, it's a realm of the variable free, not necessarily universal, of all that cannot lay claim to compulsive authority. He's talking about the peer-to-peer -peer network of voluntary interaction that we think of, you know, as the internet and of commerce and of communication. Like, it's amazing that 200 years ago, before the formalization of this, in the form of computer science and so on, that this philosopher who thought deeply about things was identifying these same three leviathans with different words. You see what I'm saying? Like, I was like, wow, you know, obviously you have to sort of read it with that particular lens, but it indicates there's something there where, uh, you know, the network became, ha, recent technology has, basically I, I define technology as, uh, I mean, there's different ways of defining it. Of course, there's a dictionary definition, which is always a good one. But an idiosyncratic definition of technology is it's the appeal to the network leviathan. It's appeal to science, it's appeal to markets, it's appeal to uh, science in the sense of experimental science, not centralized academic, quote unquote, science, you know, the experts say or whatever, right? The individual reproducible experiment. It's the decentralized, it is the peer-to-peer, -peer, it is a voluntary, it is the um, it is the things that you can visualize as happening in a network is what technology is. And, you know, it is the invention, it is the entrepreneur, because, you know, there's, there's the narrow, actually, let me actually see what the narrow dictionary definition is. The narrow dictionary definition doesn't really fully, probably doesn't fully capture. So the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, especially in industry, right? The branch of knowledge dealing with engineering or applied sciences. That's certainly good, right? And, but it doesn't fully capture what it is today, which is if you say somebody's a technologist or you say somebody's in tech, that's a culture as well. You know, you know, the equivalent would be saying somebody is an American does not simply mean that they're in North America. It's not simply a geographical designation. Um, it also carries all this cultural stuff with it, right? So saying somebody is a technologist or they're in technology, it is not simply a professional designation. It carries all this cultural stuff with it. Where is the, um, where would you say the line is between science and technology? Uh, science is theory, technology is practice. I think um, Naval quoted Danny Hillis and, and his definition was, the technology is the set of things that don't quite work yet, uh, which I thought was a, a helpful frame. It's like the in the vicinity of the frontier of applied science. Yeah, it's applied science. I mean, you know, certainly like your iPhone works, right? That's not something that's flaky. I know what he's saying, but basically, like the seed, the seed tech, start, the tech startup is the technology that doesn't quite. Which work is an yet. interesting. Like, would you consider? Apple to be a tech company anymore. Yeah, definitely they're a tech company. Um, they're not a tech startup. They're, but I mean, the thing is that basically uh, it's kind of, it's like machine learning, right? You know, what is, um, it's a good way, like what's a dog, right? You literally can give 
photos of things to ML, and it'll be a certain point where there's this weird wolf-like thing, which is, is it a dog or is it a wolf? There's something kind of on the boundary there, right? And um, so like, I think Apple is safely within the confines of, it's a technology company. Uh, and, and, and you know, it's like, it's like saying, what is the boundary of Europe, right? And you can define it via ethnicity as people used to, or via ethnicity plus religion, like it's Christendom or whatever people used to say. And it's, it's kind of a multivariable type of thing, right? Now you might define it by the boundaries of states, like you'd have a political definition, right? Um, but certainly technology today is very identified with computers and the internet, but it's certainly broader than that because, you know, it, like way before the internet, you, you know, the, the concept of technology existed, railroads and stuff. But Matt Ridley's innovation is quite, uh, his book, like how innovation works is quite good because something that he points out, which is really interesting, things that, that, that are not new under the sun are that even in like the 1700s, 1800s, like during the industrial revolution, that like hustler style tech guy existed then like gaining capital for their innovations for their real, like that all existed back then too. Okay. And the journals were attacking them back then. It's like this ridiculous, you know, thing where it's, it's, you know, Dao shells, whatever, uh, but, but very similar kinds of underlying behaviors. And so that the capitalism component is actually pretty important there in terms of what that is. And I think that the recurrent thing is the network. It's the peer to peer. It is the individual entrepreneur. It is the capitalist transaction. It is the applied and the pragmatic. Um, and it is not the holy of the faith nor is it the coercive of the state, right? But, right? And of course, I sympathize with this, uh, the third, the most, but it does have its own flaws because it's not doing global optimization. It's not making moral claims in the same way, right? It is, um, it's it's a blue-black corner of the Magic the Gathering, right? Actually, that's that might be one of the best ways of describing it. It's a blue-black bit of the Magic the Gathering thing. Do you believe, or... or startup synonymous with like a cutting edge technology, something that is newly like a new capability of humanity? No, because the thing is you can have, um, I mean, a startup is just one kind of vehicle. It's an important one nowadays. Like you can start a new company, but an open source project or a crypto protocol or even a nonprofit or just an individual tinkering individual inventor doesn't need to initially be incorporated or maybe they're incorporated on chain. Um, there's there's different vehicles. I wouldn't fixate too much on the vehicle. That vehicle is certainly a very important one in the time and place, the era that we're in, but it's not the only one. Yeah, I've, I'm flashing back through all of the sort of discoveries that were, you know, tinkerers or, you know, Gregor, Gregor yes, Mendel the, and <laughs> Gutenberg. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. It, the gentleman scientists. That's right. Those are very important, actually. And, and all the open source guys are those. Those are not startup companies per se, right? So, yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit um, while we're on the technology theme. The, the coevolution of sort of technology and humanity. I think we mentioned it really briefly before, but I would love to sort of talk about the longer arc of that because I think that's a really interesting um, piece of the ideology. Well, yeah. So I mentioned Richard Rangham's book. If you take a look at how cooking made us human, okay, this is this is a pretty good one, okay. Um, there's you know there's other kind of you know stories of like whether lactose tolerance. There's just a paper you know now that's contesting this, but there used to be this belief that um, lactose tolerance co-evolved with the cultivation of cows for, for drinking milk and whatnot. And yeah, you, you, you sort of have something where certainly tool use corresponded with like increased encephalization. You know, people have written about that. Let's go to, so the youth extension, um, era or area is something I'm super, super interested in. And I'm, I'm, very curious of what you personally are doing. Uh, if you're doing anything sort of like uncommon to preserve yourself or your health, um, in light of the fact that, you know, we may end up with 
some life extension technologies? Um, you know, I should do more, honestly. Um, like, you know, I'm doing vitamin, basically like the sort of vitamin cocktail that David Sinclair recommends. I'm doing that and I'm trying to, I've definitely been working out a lot more the last few years, but I, you know, you're reminding me, I just need to get back on it harder. Um, so. Fair enough. And then uh, collectively, I mean, um, I mean, do we need to be like picketing the FDA? Do we need to be like creating an underground like med punk movement and like trafficking and, you know, s serums or something like? I think, you know, in some ways, all of the above, like, you know, in the sense of, uh, I, I think the most important thing is just media and history to start. You need to delegitimize the FDA um, by just doing a history of it and showing, you know, th there's this uh, lecture. Did you read Regulation Disruption in the Future? Yes. Not by the, sorry, I did not know about that name, but yes. Okay. Yeah. So this particular PDF if you scroll through it, it has tons of examples of just crazy stuff that the FDA did and people don't know about it. And so like the first step is just write a history of the FDA, find these hundreds of examples of them just doing all this abuse and get that to be common knowledge among hundreds, thousands of entrepreneurs. That might seem like a small thing. It's actually a huge thing to, to know that, right? And to have it be common knowledge, everybody knows that. And to get that to, um, and to be, be a media entity, which can get that to all kinds of entrepreneurs who are dealing with the FDA, VCs who are funding them, uh, politicians who might regulate them, like all of them should know every single failure of the FDA, how they harmed entrepreneurs, all this type of stuff, because it is now possible to do that. It was not possible to do that mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Why? Because, uh, all coverage of the regulatory agencies was done by the U.S. establishment. Individuals did not have social networks. They didn't have enough trust. The institutions were too trusted. Like 10, 12 years ago, people still, to a much greater extent than you might remember, you have to like recalibrate yourself. Um, like contesting regulation back then, it was, it was kind of taboo. It was very taboo. It was like, oh, well, you want to go and poison people? What the hell? Right. Um, you know, why would you be against regulation? It's, it would be, I don't know. It, in some ways, importantly, our society actually has become more questioning of certain kinds of bad authority, even as it's also gone to quote, abolish the police. Being able to question regulation is the good aspect of the quote, abolish the police, uh, which is part of that thing is the crazy part, right? So, you know, after Uber and Airbnb and 23andMe and crypto, the regulators had to spend down a lot of their reputation over the 2010s, and similarly, just like the journos did over the 2010s. And then as a consequence, they've got just fun, even if they, they won various battles, they're losing the war because um, they're now going up against forces that they were not geared for. You know, the FDA was geared for, you know, Merck and Pfizer, and the FAA is set up for like Boeing and Airbus, and the SEC is set up for Goldman and Morgan. You know, FDA is not set up to go after a thousand personal genome guys, and the FAA is not set up to go after a million drone hobbyists, and the SEC is not set up to go after a million, you know, crypto users, right? They are they they are centralized things that are meant to go after centralized, you know, high money, mm -hmm. low risk, conservative entities that are just going to comply. Um, they're not set after set up to go after low money, highly risk tolerant individuals that will not comply and actually will be. Uh, sympathetic if enforced on, right? If you're not selling something like, you know, Hosea yeah. Vayner, he's not selling something, he's trying to do self-experimentation, he's cracked down on, it starts to look a little weird, but you're stopping somebody from just trying to take care of their own health, right? So, but I think that's absolutely step one, is just hit that really hard with media and crucially do so from the perspective of not simply in the FDA, but exit the FDA. And I mentioned this in the book, like you have to become a counter historian that understands legitimating history of these regulatory agencies better than they do and outlines a strategy for dealing with both the abuses of the American regulatory state and the abuses they claim to prevent, a V3. It, this may be extremely obvious to you, but it was not obvious to me until recently that 
I think I, I now see the network state in the context of like, it's like a 10 to 20 year battle in the 40 to 50 year war of actually unlocking the scientific progress that has been earned by science, but not distributed to people and applied in the market. That's right. Each person that really race, there's been a handoff, right? You know, we have the internet itself, and then we have, you know, the World Wide Web. And then we have Mark with the graphical web browser. And we have Google with information. And we have social networks and Facebook and so on with like online discussion and Twitter. And then we have cryptocurrencies and that gets us, you know, like digital root. And then, you, you know, there's a lot of pieces and a lot of things that have been built. And can we just snap all of those together and system integrate them, you know? Yeah, because I kept asking myself, like, what, you know, what, why is biology not starting another company that is popularizing, you know, another genomics company or a nanotech company or a nuclear, like why, why aren't you going after directly? And it occurred to me that, you know, the only explanation is that you feel like this is the, the dominant strategy that unlocks all of those other opportunities. Yeah, we have to, like, I've thought about this a lot. And the, as I said, like a startup is just one vehicle. And the problem with the startup is, it's very individual, right? You're a CEO, you've got like, you know, employees, but you, you're, you're, it's, you know, the thing about like a startup is you, you jump out of a plane and then you're, you're, you jump off a mountain, you have to build a plane before you hit the ground or whatever. Right. And, you know, because you know you run out of money. So the good thing about a startup is the extreme focus. The bad thing about a startup is the extreme focus. You cannot do broad ranging things. You cannot, you know, you have to ship, you have to make money like right away and so on and so forth. What I'm doing now is enabled by the fact that I do not need to make money and that I have some time. I have tenure, so to speak. I have distribution. Okay. So do, uh, let's, let's, uh, segue into our last section here. And I'm, I'm very excited to get through this stuff too. It's some of the stuff that I'm most excited about and excited to hear from you about. So, I, I, yeah, I want to talk about the the sort of long term goal of transhumanism, and it, it, I mean specifically what that transhum what you envision the transhumanist future to look like. Well, so first of all, like all this stuff that's in academia on life extension, uh, you know, better muscle mass, healing, fixing you know, genetic diseases with CRISPR, brain machine interface with Neuralink, all of that type of stuff, just deliver all of that alone and get that to whatever million scale, okay? That's big right there, okay? That's huge. That's that's like eyeglasses to the nth power. Yeah, so we're all superhuman strength, long-term, longer lives. Like, we, we are approaching like omniscience and omnipotence well, yeah, I mean, the, to become the 2.0 version of, basically the best version of yourself, okay? What's a reason to go and work out, right? What's a reason to lift weights? You won't necessarily become Schwarzenegger, okay? But you will become the best version of yourself. And that's kind of the the concept, become the absolute best version of yourself. And, uh, and then, you know, like the thing is, if we want to explore the stars, we're probably going to need some form of, machine and or you know genetically engineered like you know capacity there like you might not be able to breathe an atmosphere on another planet you might have to send you know telepresent robots or or something like that right yeah i mean it, it, like i want to i want to picture this transhumanist future sure so what you know i want to picture it i mean it is as much better than today in certain ways as like we are better off than the close to starvation medieval peasants right or even before then like the guys the slaves pulling up the pyramids or something like that right many human deficits like we can expand to the stars right we can maybe we can like live underwater uh, you know all kinds of things that previously restrained us go away you know, uh, we can ascend and, uh, you know, in the same way that like humans expanded out of Africa, you know, to the world, right. We can go to the oceans. We can go to the moon. We can, 
we can get there, right? It's, ac it's actually highly related to what like Lon was recently tweeting about. You know, just like oceanic navigation is a way to sort of add flippers to humans, you know, like, oh, now I can, like a whale, go across the entire sea. Oh, a submarine, okay, now I can go under the water. Oh, an airplane, I can now fly in the air. That's like transhumanism in a sense where those machines are adding to human capabilities, right? But why don't we have, um, you know, like life extension where you have longer uh, lasting lives? Why don't we have Neuralink where, um, you know, we we have Google or like a like a non-centralized version of Google, a decentralized Google, so they're not interfering with it. You have all access to all of human knowledge, at, you know, at your fingertips. Why don't we have AR glasses so you can see the world and get x-ray vision on things? Of course, certain of these things will disrupt certain kinds of social equilibria. And then you have to kind of rebuild around a new one. But overall, the concept of progressing and leveling up is like awesome, right? And, you know, people can, yeah, people will always say, oh, what about all the downsides and so on and so forth? And, you know, this is just something where you kind of have to think it's really going to be infinity or zero. I don't think it's possible to, I mean, maybe you can be like the Amish and just try to be in stasis forever. Okay. But zero is like the anarcho primitivist who has a goal. And that goal is like degrowth and the destruction of humanity and return to Gaia. And infinity is get to the stars and interstellar and explore black holes and understand the secrets of the universe and get to a unified theory of everything and advanced computer science and math and all this stuff. To me, infinity is obviously the right bet. That's refreshing. And I, like the more we, the more we can understand that path, I think the more exciting it seems, you know, I, I feel like a lot of your, a lot of the times I hear you speak, it is, it is like, we have to avoid this, you know, it's ominous. It's, it's warning. It's like, we have to avoid this dark path. Watch Limitless. Limitless probably, we, we, we kind of need like a hundred movies like Limitless. Obviously not like direct clones of that, but from a, from a tonal standpoint, have you watched that movie? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Do you remember the ending? I have heard you talk about this before and it made me want to go rewatch it. Yeah. So w watch the ending of uh, Limitless where basically he, uh, I'll just give it away, but he engineers a way. See, normally lots of technological breakthroughs are presented in a zero sum Icarus style way. Oh, they were so arrogant with their technology. They flew too close to the sun and the wings melted and they fell back to the earth. You should not have been so arrogant as to think you could aim so high, right? That's the implication of Jurassic Park and of Terminator and Black Mirror. All these things are about the hubris of these scientists who, you know, played God and did what they could not, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Limitless is so refreshing because it's like, that's that part of it that there's a catch, you know, you give the pill and it levels you up, but there's a catch and it addicts you. And so on. like, at the end of the movie, he works out the bugs because with this super intelligence, he's able to figure out like the better version of the pill, which is of course, in the same way we didn't, we weren't like Icarus in the sense that we crashed ours. We figure out how to have planes that stick up in the sky. We engineered that away, right? Like, you know, so the Helbert style, we can know, we must know. Even Helbert, yeah, okay. You could have Gerdell pushing back on that. One of the problems he proved it was unprovable, okay. But, or undecidable rather. Um, Still, yeah, okay, maybe that's like a part that we can't get to, but you can often figure out a way around the unfigureoutable. Like you might not be able to prove it, but you could get to a statistical approximation that's good enough, right? Lots of algorithms are statistical approximations that get you there um, and they're good enough. You don't need like the full, you know, closed form solution of something, right? I, th I think as a it almost has to be a fundamental tenet of like the, the philosophy of, you know, technological belief that the next problem is solvable. Yeah, that's right.
I really appreciate you hanging out with us today. This is all about laughing and learning, building leverage, and compounding our faces off. What our brains aren't evolved to comprehend is how much leverage is possible in modern society. There's a revolution going on, man. Uh, go pay attention to it. Get a part of it. Get exposed to it. You're going to make money along the way. You're going to have fun. The call to adventure. This is the new form of leverage. Take a few quiet moments for yourself. Breathe deep and be well.